three, two, one. Good evening. Welcome to the November 5th City Council meeting. I am Gina Louise Shara, and I will be presiding this evening. This meeting and all who participate in it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. Uh, we're going to begin, as always, with public comment. If you know that you wish to make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. To raise your hand, you click on the participants um, in, in your horizontal menu bar at the bottom of Zoom, and a column should open up that lists all the participants of the meeting. The raise hand feature is at the bottom of that column. If you are calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble raising your hand, you may use the chat feature to send a message to me. I'll do my best to monitor those messages for people having technical dif difficulties, um, but that's the only purpose for which we'll use that function and it'll only be used during public comment. I will unmute each raised hand one by one and ask if you'd like to make a comment. When you begin, please state your name and your city or town for the public record. To ensure everyone has an equal opportunity to speak, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes. After three minutes, I'll ask you to please finish your sentence. According to the rules uh, of the council, we do not respond during public comment as it's your time to speak. So while your comments should be directed to us, the council, you'll understand when we don't respond. You may speak on any topic. It doesn't need to be an item on the agenda. Due to the size of the meeting, that it's public and how Zoom works, all participants will need to be muted until called upon. I also ask that all but the council turn off your video until called upon as comments are directed to the council and only the person recognized has the floor. We'll do our best to act quickly if someone is clearly acting in a way that's inappropriate, deploying profanity or slurs, or displaying something outside of what one would expect in council chambers. And I'll remove anyone that needs to be removed from the meeting. If you don't wish to make a comment, we ask that you watch on channel 15 or by streaming on Northampton Open Media through their YouTube channel or their other platforms. The recording of this meeting will be available at Northampton Open Media's Government Video Archive channel on YouTube, and we thank them as always for providing that. I'll remind people we're always happy to receive comments by email, which are equally part of the public record, so please email us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. So we are going to start with public comment, and the first hand I see is Jennifer McKenna. Thank you so much. Are you ready for me? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Good evening. I'm Jennifer McKenna. I live in uh, Leeds um, and I'm speaking in support of the Roe Act resolution. I wanted to thank Councillor Ciara, Miori and Dwight for your fierce leadership in offering this resolution in support of strengthening abortion, abortion rights in our state. At this moment in our country, your leadership from the local level is critical and powerful for multiple reasons. First, your official statement of local support for proactive abortion policymaking is enormously important for state reps and senators supporting the Roe Act. This resolution publicly demonstrates we have their backs. Second, it's an official assertion of our local community's stake in state policymaking about abortion, which has a direct impact on individual people's lives, families' economic security, and the health of local communities themselves. Third, this resolution helps chip away at abortion stigma, which is so deep and pervasive in this country. By saying abortion out loud and creating a public space for community members to talk about their abortions and expose misinformation, disinformation, and myths. And finally, your resolution is a vehicle for educating community members about the significant abortion barriers still on the books in Massachusetts, which are medically unnecessary, harm people's health and economic security, and disproportionately impact communities of color, vulnerable youth, and people with low incomes. I especially appreciate that this resolution addresses the impact of COVID-19 and exacerbating the harms and inequities caused by barriers to abortion in our state. Getting rid of my phone. The Royal Act is actually a pu critical public health response to the coronavirus. Instead of passing it, our lawmakers have left barriers to abortion care in force that are making countless pregnant people in Massachusetts risk avoidable exposure to the virus and even travel out of state during a pandemic for essential health care. Leaving these barriers in place undercuts all our state leaders and essential workers are doing to control the spread of this deadly virus. And as always, those most harmed, people of color, women in abusive relationships, vulnerable youth, and those with limited resources, now including the large number of Massachusetts people who have lost their income due to, due to the pandemic. Failure to pass the Roe Act and remove these barriers is unnecessarily endangering lives 
while privileging the political agenda of a minority over the health of us all. As you well know, during the last, the last two years of state inaction on the Roe Act, the federal administration and bench have further dismantled our reproductive health rights and further institutionalized misogyny and white supremacy. And that's about to get worse. In short, it's long past time we passed the Roe Act. Thank you so much for this new resolution, urging our legislature to do it now. And thank you for giving a visual voice to the majority in our community who respect our right to make our own decisions about our bodies, our lives, and our futures. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oops. Next, uh, we have Lindsay Sabadosa. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Thank you to the Northampton City Council for allowing me to speak briefly here this evening and to Councillors Shiara Maori and Dwight for their work on this evening's further resolution in support of the Roe Act. I'm grateful to the Council for this work and for your continued passionate, loud support for reproductive freedom. In recent days, in the last 48 hours in particular, we have been reminded that democracy requires patience. The legislative process is no different. However, the Roe Act is a bill that requires us to be impatient. Abortion is not a procedure that allows for delay. It cannot be postponed. And so every single day we delay in passing the Roe Act, there are those who suffer because of our inaction. It is particularly poignant during this pandemic. With travel bans in effect, patients who have needed to have a procedure after 24 weeks have been required to travel to Colorado, New Mexico, Maryland, or Washington, D.C. during a pandemic to obtain health care, taking risks that were completely and totally unnecessary had they just been allowed to receive that same care right here in Massachusetts. Minors who have used judicial bypass have had to explain to a judge via Zoom whether they are mature enough to parent or to have an abortion. During times of incredible economic insecurity and significant unemployment, patients have had to figure out how they can afford a procedure that starts at $700 and only goes up after the first eight weeks. All of this could be resolved with the Roe Act. And right now we have a commitment from the legislature, from the speaker and from the Senate president to take up a bill that protects reproductive freedoms. In the House, we have arrived at that point thanks to the outpouring of support, and I won't lie, the little girls in their RBG sweatshirts reminding us all that discrimination on the basis of sex is discrimination, and restrictions on access to health care based on one's reproductive organs is also discrimination. Your action and support of this legislation this evening, however, are still deeply necessary because we cannot just pass a bill that protects reproductive freedoms. We must pass a bill that includes all the provisions of the Roe Act. We must put the right to abortion in state law, remove judicial bypass, allow for abortions after 24 weeks in the case of lethal fetal diagnoses, update the outdated medically inaccurate language from our state law, and establish safety net coverage for abortion for people who don't have health insurance, because care you cannot afford is not health care. With your support and a loud chorus of voices demanding that Massachusetts lead, we can do more than just pass a bill. We can pass the Roe Act and ensure that no one ever has to jump over hurdles to get the care that they want and need. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, though you need no introduction, could you please state <laughs> your name and city or town for the record? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Lindsay Sabadosa and I reside here in Northampton. Thank you. Thank you. Next. We have Kara or Kara um, McElney. Good evening. My name is Kara McElhone. Um, I'm uh, it was close. <laughs> I'm speaking in regards uh, to order number 20.135. I'm the executive director of the Children's Advocacy Center of Hampshire County. Let me begin by saying how grateful we are for the city of Northampton and Smith Volk's many years of support. Thank you for partnering with us to keep to help kids get the safety, healing, and justice that they deserve. Someday, I hope an organization like ours would not need to exist, but for now, we do. Because one in four girls and one in six boys are sexually abused before they turn 18 years old. One in five kids is sexually solicited online. And in Massachusetts, 84% of perpetrators are someone that child knows, trusts, and loves. Most kids never tell anyone about the abuse. But we're here if and when they're ready to share their stories. The Children's Advocacy Center of Hampshire County, the CAC, coordinates care for kids as they navigate the process of disclosing abuse. 
The CAC model is one that's used around the country. To better understand what a CAC is, you must understand what a child would face without one. Without a CAC, the child may end up having to be taken to multiple locations to tell the worst story of their life over and over again. Instead, a child comes to the CAC, a safe, child-focused environment, and tells their story once to a trained interviewer. In an adjoining room, a multidisciplinary team of professionals, child welfare workers, police, prosecutors, advocates, and more, gather to learn what happened and to make a plan for that child. A central tenet of the CAC model is to offer a safe, child-friendly space that mitigates any additional trauma kids may face when they're able to tell their story. The house on Elm Street provides comfort and privacy for children and families. We have an on-site medical suite for necessary exams. We have a team observation room and closed caption cameras to record interviews of abused children, as well as a welcoming reception area for kids and families. We've been able to provide the safe space thanks to the many years of support from Smith Vogue and the city of Northampton. Since moving into the house on Elm Street in 2006, the CAC has helped more than 2,000 abused kids in our community. All of our services are free of charge and provided to children for as long as they need them. For a long time, we were a very small organization with only one part-time employee. And over the past few years, we've grown and now have three employees at the house every day. We have advocates who specialize in helping kids regardless of prosecution, and one staff person who focuses on online safety and child trafficking. We provide programming and training to schools, community centers, religious organizations, physicians, therapists, first responders to make Hampshire County safer for kids. We envision the CAC house to be a hub of child safety in Hampshire County. We hope to be able to purchase the house and provide a permanent home for the Children's Advocacy Center at 593 Elm Street. Owning the house takes us one step closer to ensuring sustainability and fulfilling our promise to abuse kids that we will be here when they need us for as long as they need us. And we need your help to take the next step. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Tara. Next, we have Carrie Baker. My name is Carrie Baker and I live in Northampton, Massachusetts. I'm a lawyer and a professor at Smith College and I'm the president of the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Massachusetts. I come before you today to urge you to pass a resolution in support of the Roe Act. With the passing of women's rights icon, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the confirmation of Trump's appointee, Amy Coney Barrett, Bill Ginsburg's seat on the Supreme Court, federal constitutional protection for the right to abortion health care is at imminent risk. With Barrett, conservatives have consolidated a 6-3 supermajority of justices who are unanimous in their hostility to abortion rights and the Roe versus Wade precedent. And without Democrats as a majority of the Senate, we will not be able to pass affirmative protections for abortion rights in Congress. Therefore, the Massachusetts legislature must act now to secure the right to abortion health care in the state. The Roe Act would protect and strengthen abortion rights in Massachusetts and remove several medically unnecessary restrictions that are forcing pregnant people to travel out of state for this essential health care during this pandemic. Rigorous longitudinal research proves that restricting access to abortion harms people's health. A team of researchers led by Dr. Diana Green Foster provided definitive evidence that abortion access strongly enhances women's health and well being, whereas denying abortion causes physical and economic harm. People who accessed the abortion care they wanted had better physical and mental health outcomes, were more financially stable, set more ambitious goals, were more likely to find a good romantic partner, were more likely to have a wanted child after the abortion and raise their children under more stable circumstances. By contrast, people denied a wanted abortion experienced more serious health problems, were likely to be left to raise the child alone, were more likely to stay in contact with a violent partner and experienced economic hardship and insecurity, which lasted for years. And I can provide that study for you if you'd like. Advocates across the state have been working hard for close to two years to pass the Roe Act. With the COVID-19 pandemic, 
the need for the law is all the more urgent so that pregnant people don't have to travel out of state to get abortion health care. We're losing federal level protections for abortion health care, so we must create state level protections. The Roe Act is a matter of basic health care and well being for people in Massachusetts. Please support the Roe Act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Patrick Melnick. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. My name is Pat Melnick and I live in Leeds. And I don't know most of you, but I uh, lived in Northampton my entire life. And I don't have one of these big uh, public issues uh, on the agenda tonight. I've got a, a purely personal one. And as you can see from my email I sent you uh, two days ago, and I'm pretty angry about the uh, uh, attempt to confiscate my money uh, without ever being notified by anybody that this was under process. I've been a resident my whole life, and it's frankly infuriating that the city would try to take money from me without notifying me they're intending to do so. I should have suspected it because the planning board, again without notice, already decided uh, to withhold my, my escrow funds. But that's beside the point. The, the whole the point, the reason I'm here tonight is to let you know that this is a zoning issue. This is not a city council issue. That I have a dispute with the DPW about whether or not two stormwater systems for roof drains have been put in or not. And my engineers say they were put in. The city engineers, for whatever reason, don't believe my, my own engineers. But that's an engineering decision. That's not a city council decision. You can't decide whether or not you're not engineers, whether or not my engineer is right or their engineer is right. And to have them behind my back come to the city council and try to stab me and try to grab my money and hire engineers to resolve this issue is completely inappropriate. This should be before the Zoning Board of Appeals and ultimately before the courts. And it was my intention to go there. I told uh, planning last month that I wanted a denial letter so that I could take the next step to go to the Zoning Board or to the courts. And I'm still waiting for that denial letter. And I get a letter from the DPW two days ago telling me that you've already acted on this at one point. It's completely, uh, you know, infuriating. Now, I, I got to tell you, if the DPW had the right to as confiscate my money, they would have already done it. If the planning board had the right to do it, they would have already done it. They don't have the right to do it, and nor do you. They're asking you to do it because they're trying to get cover. They don't have any right to just grab money. You don't have any right to grab money either. And having you vote to do that is just trying to get them to have some cover. So I'd ask you to would not, not to act to give planning board and DPW cover for something they don't have the right to do. The money's going to sit there till this is resolved and it's going to be resolved by the zoning board or the courts. And that's where it should be resolved. You folks shouldn't be part of it. The DPW and planning should have made it, should not have made you part of it. And basically that's uh, where I stand. Oh, uh, one other thing. If, I, if it goes against me, for example, if the zoning board or the courts say I'm wrong, I have to do this, I'll do it. But I'm pretty sure the court's going to say that I'm right, my engineers are right, and we did everything appropriately. But that's a decision to be made by a judicial body, not by a city council. Thanks very much. Thank you. Next, I'm going to go to Yoko, who was having trouble doing the voice feature. Okay, can you unmute? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. I'm here to support the Children's Advocacy Center. My name is Yoko Kato. I've been involved with the CAC for the last 20 years, and I've been a member of the board for the last nine years. 27 years ago, I lost my 23 years old daughter, Sherry, and her 18 months old baby, Cedric, to violent crime in Northampton. Ever since then, I became a voice for victims of domestic violence and victims of child abuse who no longer has voices. Children is our future. We must protect them. CAC's work is preventing child abuse and providing safety and healings and a justice. My commitment to support the CAC is the hoping someday there will be fewer or no more child abuse in our community. 
it is essential to have CAC locally. And I will continue to be a voice for victims until I meet Sherry and Cedric again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Kate Glenn. Kate. Hi, am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Um, good evening. My name is Kate Glenn. I live in Northampton. Um, and I would like to add my voice to the chorus of those who stand in support of the passage of the resolution to support the Roe Act um, by the city council. Um, I wanna echo every word that Carrie Baker, Lindsay Sabadosa and Jennifer McKenna have said. Up until this last February, I owned a child's garden, which was formerly right across the street from city hall and spent 13 years supporting new families as we hosted registries, helped them decode the mysteries of cloth diapers, taught them how to hold their babies in slings and generally listened to um, what it is like to be a new parent and to figure out how you wanna be in the world with your child. For the last six years, I've worked with the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Mass. I've been an intake member of the intake team and now currently sit on the board and I'm the co-coordinator of our volunteer force. And I can say unequivocally that while it sounds like those two activities may be, may be different, they are, they are linked um, in a fundamental way. Um, I've been thinking a lot about how we can, how we move forward as a community, as a nation, as a country. Um, through whatever happens with the election, whichever way the chips fall, um, I've been thinking about how do we come together. And I think that one of the basic things that we can all agree on is that you have rights over your body. I have rights over mine. Bodily autonomy is a basic human right. And passing the Roe Act codifies this into Massachusetts law. I can say from firsthand experience, listening to those who are um, calling to the Abortion Rights Fund um, to ask for help, um, that this decision is not one that is taken lightly. And it is vital that we as a, as a Northampton community stand with those who insist and demand that the rights over your body and your life remain with you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have the phone number ending in 4006. Um, so try hitting star nine unmute. And hopefully that'll work. Oh, hi. Hi, um, my name is the Reverend Peter Ives. Um, I was the minister of the um, the Northampton um, Church uh, in the center of town for many, many years. I've been a minister in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and in New Haven, Connecticut. And I feel very strongly that clergy um, should take a strong stand for the passage of the state's Roe Act. Uh, I think it's very important for religious leaders to support all of you uh, who are asking the city council to support the passage of the Roe Act. And I have worked closely with Carrie Baker um, and everything Carrie has said to you um, is what I would want to say to you too, because uh, Carrie is one of the great Northampton spokespersons uh, for uh, the Roe Act. Um, and as a minister, I see the need, the need for so many mothers to have an abortion for so many legitimate reasons. Uh, so deeply, deeply legitimate for why they have to do this. Uh, and, and it's not easy. It's not easy as a pastor, but it, it, it's, it's clear to me that women try very hard to make this decisions and it's important that they have the freedom to make it. Um, and there came a time when my wife and I ourselves had to make this decision. And so we too know what it feels like and yet how important 
this is uh, for people who need to have an abortion. And I hope you will support the state Roe well Act at this time. Thank you, Reverend Ives. Okay. Next, uh, we have Pete. Hey everybody, um, my name is Pete Kranzis. I'm from East Hampton, Connecticut, and this is about the Main Street Redesign Project. I'd like to officially um, ask the city council if I could we could add this as an agenda item to an upcoming meeting. I've been doing a bunch of research um, on issues with Vision Zero projects, and the main goal would be to address these things ahead of time so they don't cause issues later. I am actually meeting with Wayne Flyden tomorrow morning. We're gonna have a chat. Um, I forwarded him a bunch of things already. Uh, once again, I just want to make sure we're not leaving ourselves open um, for any of the pitfalls that are commonly occur with these types of meetings. So if you could consider it, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have iPhone. Oops, sorry. Can you unmute? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Rasheen Quinn and I'm a resident of Northampton and I live downtown. Um, I'm just questioning, I know we're in uh, you know, unusual times and I'm a huge proponent of freedom of speech, but having Main Street shut down yesterday at four o'clock, um, you know, it was problematic for many reasons. For parents trying to go pick up children, for people trying to leave and go to and from work, for people trying to get home, um, for employees trying to get to restaurants and businesses on Main Street, and even for people who want to come to Main Street, but it's shut down. And I'm just wondering who gets to decide when Main Street is shut down? Our, our businesses are, they're, they're in trouble. And for Wednesday at four o'clock to be told by the police department that there's three protests planned, and they have to shut down Main Street. And keep in mind that we've chosen to, to defund them as well, partially. Um, you know, it's it's the fifth protest I think since Sunday, and it's, I you know, I don't know if it's just because we are in unusual times, but it's it's affecting not just businesses. It's people who live here. It's people who work here. It, there's many people coming from out of town to protest. I've cleaned up personally at Pulaski Park after protest, but I'm just wondering who gets to look at the residents and the people as a whole and how everybody else is affected. And um, I just feel like it, Route 9 actually is, in my mind, a major thoroughfare. It's, I think it's state route. I don't know that we can just decide to shut it down whenever we want. Um, and I think it's gone the past the point of common sense. And our restaurants and businesses downtown are feeling it, residents are feeling it. And I don't know, I just think it, there needs to be a different way. I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't have protests. I just think we can't shut Main Street down at four o'clock on a Wednesday. I think everyone's going to be okay and not affected by that. I think it's becoming really, really, um, in some ways, unsafe as well. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Kara Crochier. Crochier. Kara. Yes, my name is Kara Crochier. I live in Montgomery, commenting on item 20.135 as a proud CAC board member. The CAC House is incredibly important to our organization and to our mission. The House is such an important and unique resource in our community. It's really more than a house. It's a safe haven for children to have, direct, to have a direct treatment line and necessary resources at one location. I think we can all agree it's important to feel safe, understood, and protected, and this house represents that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Kristen Sykes. Okay, great. Good evening, thank you so much. My name is Kristen Sykes. I live in Bay State Village in Florence. And I'm here to join the many other compatriots I have here speaking in favor of the resolution 
urging action on the ROE Act. And I thank councillors Maori, Shiara, and Dwight for their leadership on this issue. Believe it or not, even though it's 2020, 11 states passed laws in 2019 which restrict access to abortion. And I'm horrified by these attacks on reproductive rights and healthcare for all individuals. As many folks have said, every person should have access to a full range of medical options when it comes to decisions about their pregnancy. And um, I love what Kate said earlier about body autonomy. As a young woman in my 20s, if I didn't have access to reproductive rights, my life would have been changed forever. In Massachusetts, the basic right to abortion has been protected by our state Supreme Court since 1981. Um, but this is threatened potentially by the Supreme Court with the appointment of Amy Coney Barrett. And if Congress opposes abortion rights, it could impact the Commonwealth. We need to pass the Roe Act ASAP. I really appreciate all the support of the counselors and hope that we can see this happen swiftly and that um, folks with a uterus are able to make decisions that they want to about their own bodies. Thank you so much for offering this resolution. Thank you. Next, we have Mo McGinnis. Hi, everybody. My name is Mo McGinnis. I'm owner of Sylvester's in downtown Northampton and Roberto's. And for many years, we've worked in Northampton. I was, my husband and I were foster children, uh, foster parents for years in Northampton and that brought us to the CAC house. And we are big advocates and I'm also a board member on the CAC and we're looking to be supported in the resolution of purchasing the house on 593 Elm Street. And we're hoping we can make that happen. The CAC unfortunately is very busy right now with cases and that's a very sad thing, but what's real important to remember is it is an area in which our whole community, a multi-disciplinary um, team, the police and the social workers, the teachers, the parents can all gather and help uh, solve real problems like childcare together. And so we're hoping that you will support us in that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, hey, that is everyone who has their hand raised right now. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at public comment? If so, oh, wait, Councillor Nash. Councillor Nash. Unmuted. Let's see, am I unmuted? You are unmuted, do you? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I have somebody, I have Hildegard is here to speak for public comment. Okay. Um, Hildegard? You yes. You have the floor. Thank you. I spoke to Annie Lusto just a few hours ago in regard to the relevance of this at a city council meeting, and she did not seem to object to my bringing this up. I am not allowed at a policing uh, policy meeting to have public comment. Uh, I spoke to you last time, and I shall continue if we have the time tonight, with the new methodology for police that's a game changer and allows them to walk in the door, uh, which I went into at length at the last meeting. But let me begin saying I am living in Northampton at 35 Fruit Street. Cahill Apartments is a government housing. In my experience with what I call crime is flagrant. I mean, I had crime in my childhood. My father had a Whitey Bulger gang coming in an emergency physician's office. I had crime in a, in a second marriage with a junkie dentist husband, but I have more crime than I ever imagined in public housing. The people that spoke at the policing procedure meeting were excellent, except for their opinions that, well, when I moved to Northampton from Springfield, I was delighted there's no crime. Uh, you need someone on this staff, but it's too late now, from public housing, not me, 
you need someone from public housing. When I moved here, I moved into apartment G68K Hill, where a woman had committed suicide who was due to go to prison for an assault. Her name was Hernanda. She lived with a son, someone legally here with uh, Johnny Hernandez. I have witnessed in building B endless numbers of whether you want to call them homicide, suicide, or, or overdose, you, you might think that the police are at times confused because I don't agree with their, their language of how they diagnose each one. Someone just died last week by the name of Dustin Dextrace, the son of Dennis Dextrace in B33. Cahill Apartments. There have been endless, over the last 20 years, in my mind, endless numbers of overdose and, or, 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 or homicide or suicide. I don't think we know. I think that we are confused when we diagnose and including the police are confused. So that is what I wanted to say, that there is crime and opiates when they are distributed, if the person is able to walk in the door, that game changer that I recommended last week that was used by uh, outgoing Mayor Bianchi in Pittsfield, but can be used not just as a grant. If we are able to walk in the door, we can witness someone dealing with drugs and many, many other things. So I think I'm going yes. to leave it at that and not confuse you because I need four or five sessions to go further into the new methodology that I recommend that was used in an anti-gang grant. And Jim has the uh, You're at time. So paper review. I was wrong. It was 2016, not 2017 when I addressed with this and when I took my colleague who I did an FBI study. So your your time is up, Hildegard. Okay, I'm all set. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any is there anybody else who would like to comment to us this evening? I don't see any other hands. So see, let me just do a quick scroll through. Okay. Seeing no one else, um, then we will start the meeting. Laura, um, will you please take the roll? Sure. Councillor Dwight. Here. Councillor Foster. Here. Councillor Jarrett. Here. Councillor Labarge. Here. <coughs> Councillor Maori. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Here. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Excellent, thank you. Okay, first up on our agenda this evening is the announcement of two public hearings. The first one is an announcement of a public hearing regarding the FY 2021 tax levy. The Northampton City Council will hold a public hearing on Thursday, November 19th, 2020 at 7.05 p.m. via remote participation to discuss the percentages of the local tax levy to be borne by each class of real and personal property within the city of Northampton for FY fiscal year 2021 in accordance with chapter 40, section 56 of the Massachusetts General Laws. Information regarding this hearing will be available for public in inspection online at www.northamptonma.gov on or before November 17th, 2020, after 12 p.m. Instructions for accessing the hearing will be posted on the November 19th, 2020 City Council agenda at northamptonma.gov no, no later than 48 hours prior to the meeting. The City Council will hear all persons who wish to be heard thereon. The next announcement is for, a public, for public hearing for uh, item 20.126 Comcast petition to install underground conduit under King Street dated September 14th, 2020, per Mass General Law, Chapter 166, Section 22. A public hearing will be held on Thursday, November 19th, 2020, at 7.05 p.m. Uh, we might wanna change, do we wanna 
amend that, Laura, to 710? Oh, there yes, it's at the same. Well, hmm. yes, that would be good. Or 715. Um, right. I didn't notice. Um, on uh, So we held on, um, on the petition of Comcast in Massachusetts uh, to ink to erect poles and wires upon along under or across one or more public ways. Unnumbered petition dated 9-14-2020, King Street. The hearing will be held via remote participation. Please see the agenda for the no November 19th, 2020 City Council meeting for instructions for accessing that hearing. So those will both be at our next meeting on November 19th. Next up, um, do we have any updates? Well, next up there's, I'll do an announcement first regarding executive session minutes. Um, the Open Meeting Law, Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 22, requires public bodies to regularly review minutes of executive session to determine if they are eligible for release. With the assistance of the Administrative Assistant, Laura Kutzler, um, I've reviewed the minutes and determined that due to pending litigation, non-disclosure of the executive session minutes of November 16, 2017 and September 19, 2019 is still warranted, so they have not been released yet. And now are there other announcements by committee chairs? Hold on, I can't see everybody. Oh, oh Councilor Labarge. I'm sorry, um, thank you. I just wanted to announce, um, which I did talk with Councilor Nash um, two weeks ago at our city council, um, I mean, at, at the <laughs> commission meeting that as a city councilor and being on the Commission on Disabilities, I did bring it to the commission's attention. It was scheduled for the month of October, but because of the holiday weekend, our ADA coordinator didn't realize that he had to get that posted in within a certain time. So the Commission on Disabilities, everybody does now have um, the whole layout on the plastic reduction and so forth. And we do have a meeting scheduled um, for November on the second Tuesday at four o'clock PM. So I just wanted to give you some updates on that. Thank you. Thank you. Other chairs with announcements. Um, okay, moving on to one minute announcements. Um, I just like to start and recognize uh, City Clerk Pam Powers, her staff, election workers, and volunteers, as we, I'm sure, all have been glued to watching votes being counted all across this country right now. It's just, I think, I just really want to recognize how smoothly everything has gone here in Northampton and really thank them for that. Um, it's a real testament to the hard work and the planning that and the organization that they put in this of course is an election season like none other for so many reasons but they've there have been so many changes and things that they've had to adapt to and figure out and just kudos to them and just unending gratitude um any other announcements okay i see councillor jarrett councillor nash and then councillor mayori thank you um uh, first, I wanted to announce that the planning board is holding three public forums, so I'm encouraging people to attend and, and share their feedback there about. Um, one is the Picture Main Street Forum, which is about the redesign of Main Street in downtown, and that's this downtown Northampton. That's Tuesday, November 10th at 7. And then uh, a form-based code for downtown Northampton, um, which is part of the planning board meeting Thursday, November 12th at 8 p.m., and then also a form-based code check-in for the Florence Village District, uh, Tuesday, November 17th at, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, form-based code focuses on guiding the physical form of the buildings in the streetscape rather than the separation of uses. Um, so um, I hope to hear uh, from folks and especially Ward 5 folks for the Florence Village District one. Um, second, um, I'm on the Northampton Policing Review Commission and our Alternatives to Policing Subcommittee uh, has met and our next meeting is mon this Monday, uh, the 9th at 6.30 p.m. and it will focus on mental health uh, related services. Um, we've invited a member of the police department to attend to explain the current process um, and we welcome public comment at the beginning of that meeting. 
And then finally, um, thinking about uh, how um, more more personal note um, with um, with the tumultuous and uncertain time that we're in, um, I pers perspective that I found useful is to remember uh, that uh, hope and optimism is a decision to make rather than a reaction to what's going on. And uh, that decision helps to guide me and inspire me even in the difficult circumstances. So thank you. Thank you for that, that very uplifting personal note. Um, Councillor Nash. Thank you, Council President. Thank you, Councillor Jarrett, for the optimism idea. I, I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, my announcement is uh, the Youth Commission has been uh, holding a, a number of informational Zoom meetings about the plastic reduction ordinance. Uh, to It's designed to uh, meet with business uh, leaders. They flyered downtown. The last one is tomorrow. Uh, the last scheduled one is tomorrow from 1 to 2 p.m. And information on how to link into that meeting is on the city website. If you go to, uh, it, it's posted as a, a meeting uh, tomorrow. So you can hit that link and get a link to uh, the Zoom meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Mayori. Yeah, so I also want to thank Councilor Jared. I didn't realize how starved I was for optimism until you said that, <laughs> so thanks. And I uh, wanted to echo what uh, President Chiara uh, was saying about our uh, city clerk, Pam Powers, and the election this year was just amazing. I mean, how complex could that be? And it was pretty impressive. Um, and I just wanted to add, I don't know if anyone saw this um, this uh, spreadsheet in the Gazette with the voting percentages in Western Mass, but I am really want to thank all, um, all the voters out there um, and this robust show of civic engagement. Um, Northampton has 82% as it's 82% um, of voters voted. Um, I hope we can keep this up. It's impressive and I'm really proud to be part of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Quinlan and Councillor Foster. I, I just uh, am so thankful to hear all of you. I just, what a, what a week. Um, so it's great to be together and, and see your faces and hear your voices. Uh, but in addition, I wanted to mention that I, uh, this week, Tuesday, I spent a few hours volunteering with Grow Food Northampton. Uh, in their community food distribution project. Uh, and there is still uh, open slots to volunteer for, for residents. You can go on their website to fill out their volunteer form uh, and they'll be in touch about opportunities. And also uh, that's kind of in partnership with the Survival Center on Prospect Street. Uh, and again, there's also volunteer opportunities at the Survival Center. So I'd encourage you if you have time and the will to do it to, uh, to join in. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Foster. Uh, on a similar note to Councillor Quinlan um, and Councillor Jared, again, thank you for the optimism in one way. Um, I know many of us are, um, some, some way people have been, been dealing with uncertain times is through baking and cooking. And so I wanted to make sure people know that there is an outlet for that that can make a real difference in our community. Um, Cathedral in the night on every Sunday evening um, at First Churches serves a free meal to our community, um, the need since COVID um, has increased significantly, they're serving 70 to 90 meals every Sunday um, for the community. Um, and uh, you know, many residents who are houseless or food insecure are taking advantage of those meals. Um, since March, um, I've been working with the Northampton Kiwanis Club to make sure that there are meals available for those who are vegetarian as well as baked goods uh, for everybody. And so I encourage anybody to get in touch with me, um, send me an email and I can help you sign up um, to help keep this going. Um, I've committed to doing it through the, through the length um, until the churches in, in town are back in service. Thank you. Any other announcements? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to resolutions and we have 20.146, a resolution urging action on the ROW Act. This is a first reading and I will read it. This is in the City Council on November 5th, 2020, upon the recommendation of Councillor Gina Louise Shara, Councillor William H. Dwight, and Councillor Rachel Maori, R20.146, a resolution urging action on the Roe Act. Whereas the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on September 18th, 2020, and the appointment of Amy, Amy Coney Barrett on October 27th, 2020, one week before the presidential election, has put Roe v. Wade 
uh, decided in 1973, and the subsequent Supreme Court cases that have affirmed the right to make personal medical decisions about when or if to have a child in the most dire jeopardy of their history. Whereas the Trump-Pence administration has enabled states to implement unconstitutional bans and restrictions to legal and safe abortions, with the end goal of creating legal challenges that could overturn Roe v. Wade if they ascend to the Supreme Court. Whereas the overturn of Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade would leave many states and whole regions of the United States with very restricted or no access to legal and safe abortions. And 10 states have already passed, quote, trigger laws, unquote, that would ban abortion as soon as Roe is overturned. Whereas it is essential that states protect and bolster abortion access and stand as bulwarks protecting the right to legal reproductive health care for their own residents and for those that will need to travel out of state to obtain safe health care. Whereas states such as New York, Vermont, Illinois, and the District of Columbia have acted to protect rights to reproductive health care if Roe v. Wade is overturned. Whereas 74% of Massachusetts residents support legal access to abortion, which is the highest support of any state. And whereas despite this overwhelming support, there's currently no state law that asserts that abortion is legal in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, protecting that right outside of the federal right afforded by Roe v. Wade. Whereas current Massachusetts abortion law includes medically unnecessary and harmful restrictions, incorrect and inappropriate definitions in terminology and other restrictions that are on the books such as a 24 hour waiting period, but have been superseded by Roe v. Wade since 1973. If Roe v. Wade is overturned, these will be the standing laws for Massachusetts. Whereas the COVID-19 crisis has heightened and highlighted the harm and inequities of the 24 week ban and judicial bypass restrictions in Massachusetts. These restrictions force pregnant people to have avoidable exposure or to travel out of state to access care, which is burdensome always, but potentially endangering or prohibited during a pandemic. Whereas the current restrictions disproportionately affect those who are black, indigenous, people of color, or those that are low income and who already suffer from unequal access and systemic barriers to health care. Whereas the Roe Act, an act to remove obstacles and expand abortion access, S 1209 and H 3320, which is co-sponsored by Northampton State Senator Joanne N. Comerford and State Representative Lindsay N. Sabadosa, will codify and protect the right to abortion in the Commonwealth, correct prejudicial and incorrect language in the general law, remove gestational age from the language so termination may still occur for fetal abnormalities, remove judicial bypass and provide coverage for those who do not qualify for mass health. Whereas on June 20th, 2019, the Northampton City Council passed, quote, a resolution affirming support for access to safe and legal abortion in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and across the United States, unquote, supporting and urging the passage of the Roe Act by the state legislature. And whereas the Roe Act has remained unaddressed in the state's leg state legislature's joint committee on the judiciary since 2019. Now, therefore be it resolved that the City Council of Northampton hereby reasserts its initial endorsement and asks the state legislature to move with all deliberate speed and urgency to pass the Roe Act. Without immediate action, they jeopardize the rights and health of their constituents and leave the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts at risk of the loss of their current, safe, current right to safe and legal abortion. Be it further resolved that the administrative assistant to the city council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to Massachusetts Governor Charles Baker, Senate President Karen Spilka, House Speaker Robert DeLeo, lead sponsor of S-1209, State Senator Harriet L. Chandler, lead sponsors of H-3320, State Representatives Prusha A. Haddad and J. D. Livingstone, chairs of the Joint Committee on the Judiciary, State Senator James B. Eldridge and State Representative Claire D. Cronin, State Senator Joanne N. Carford, and State Representative Lindsay N. Sabadosa. Okay. Is there? Move, move approval, please. I'll second. second. Motion was made by Councillor Dwight and seconded by Councillor Labarge. I'll lead off on comments if you don't mind. Um, I want to, first I want to thank my sponsors for joining me on, uh, my co-sponsors on this resolution, and I want to thank Jennifer McKenna, the Abortion Rights Fund of Western Mass, um, others, many of who spoke this evening for their guidance and their tireless and truly inspiring work for abortion rights here in Western Mass, but, um, also beyond. Uh, a lot has happened since the council passed the resolution, reiterating our support of abortion rights in general and supporting the Roe Act in particular in June, 2019. 
a lot has happened and is happening. Um, this is an extreme time and there is so much heightened rhetoric and I'm not really sure how to project through the din of it. Um, and I recognize I'm adding to it, but I, I just can't state strongly enough that this is an emergency. Um, it's an emergency that I think many, if not most of the three quarters of the Commonwealth and likely more who fully support abortion rights um, and laws are aware of that it's such an emergency. Um, at this moment, we're as concerned as we were back in June, 2019 about eliminating the unnecessary and discriminatory restrictions, correcting archaic and incorrect and honestly offensive language that is in our state abortion laws. But in the context of now, this moment, this is an absolute screaming emergency um, because right now in Massachusetts, we don't have an affirmative law legalizing and protecting abortion if Roe v. Wade falls. The overturning of Roe Ro is very much the prize, you all know, is very much the prize that Republicans have been fighting for. And with the appointment of Barrett, the pieces are in place for the court to do that. Many, like myself, who have lived our lives um, in a time where our fundamental, the fundamental rights to control decisions about our body have been protected by Roe, albeit with state restrictions, we, that's all we've known. And we're likely gonna experience what it's gonna be like without that federal protection. While we've always known that we need to fight for Roe v. Wade, um, I think there's less recognition that we really need to fight for state protections. Even in a state like Massachusetts, where we have, I think, a false sense of security, there is no security. People need to know that there isn't a law that secures the right to safe and legal abortion in Massachusetts. And in fact, the laws that are on the books include things that are currently unenforced, like a mandatory waiting period, and these were created by anti-abortion legislators in 1974 in response to Roe v. Wade. This has to be corrected. It cannot wait. As I believe uh, Representative Sabadosa said this week, the Senate president um, and the speaker have both put out a statement committing to taking up Roe before the end of the year. Um, that's great. And with all respect to her representative, um, it, that's great, but leaving that up to a promise from the state legislature that they'll act quickly makes me a little bit queasy because they're not really known for acting quickly. Um, so I think it's really important that we state this as firmly as we possibly can and we use our political voice. And I ask my, my fellow counselors to do this with me. Um, and I also ask that you and all the residents of Northampton do everything you can in addition to this to make it known that this must happen in the next six or so weeks before the session ends. There is no other option. We need to have this protection. So thank you so much for, for joining me in this. Councilor Labarge. Thank you. Um, I am in full support of the Roe Act and there's no question about it. I think what bothers me, and I think our council president, Gina Shera, put it right where it's at. Here we did a resolution in June 20th of 2019. The North Dittman City Council passed the resolution affirming support for access to safe and legal abortion. It'll be almost a year and it's been sitting on the table. And that tells me something. And you said exactly what is right, Councilor Shear. We need to act on this immediately. Even though we're hearing, yes, you know, it's sitting there, but they're gonna do something about it. I don't trust it at all, at all. So I am supporting this and I, I just feel that this needs to be passed immediately. And I think State Rep. Lindsay Sabadosa did an excellent job thoroughly today explaining about the Roe Act, explaining about how women have to travel out of state to have an abortion and especially during the COVID-19. I think as a woman, all of us that are women have a rights to say what we wanna do with our bodies. And if we want an abortion, we should have a right to say we want an abortion and be able to be in our own state and be safe and feel that we have the rights to do what we want to do with our body and having a very safe, safe area and having healthcare available for us. So I am supporting this. 
Yeah. Councilor Mayori. Yeah, I, I want to, um, I do feel very appreciative of our state rep and our um, state senator on this. And I, I want to thank my co-sponsors as well, um, President Chiara and um, Councilor Dwight. Uh, with a special appreciation for you, President Chiara, because of your longtime advocacy on this issue. Um, and you made this resolution happen, and I'm, I'm so glad for it. Um, Ner Neral, um, just for some perspective, so, much, so many things have been said, but I, I think that we need to be reminded that the majority of uh, residents in Massachusetts su support safe, uh, legal, access to abortion. Nayral confirms that eight in 10 voters, including those who identify as Catholic, want Roe v. Wade to be upheld and further believe that if a woman has decided to have an abortion, it should be safe, legal, affordable, and available, available in her community without shame or pressure. These 80% of voters agree that we need to pass laws, quote, to respect, support, and empower women, ensuring that everyone has access to respectful, quality, and affordable reproductive health care, including abortion. And yet, this is not currently being represented in Massachusetts. Um, so I just, you know, I, let us not pretend on a, a state or, or a federal level that these attacks to access the safe and legal abortion are part of a, a larger cynical agenda that includes undermining you know, the Violence Against Women Act, uh, rolling back harassment protections and the rights of trans people, forced hysterectomies and ICE detention center. And to me, these are um, kind of all related and they're all meant to tamp down the very status and locus of control and human rights of women. We are, you know, we're not shielded from this direct assault on access to reproductive health care just by virtue of living in Massachusetts. And it makes it clear that all the provisions in the Roe Act are essential. And the, the, at least the governance of Massachusetts should be doing, um, it's the least that the governance of Massachusetts should be doing for over half of its residents. We need the strongest possible legislation and advocacy at the federal, state, and local level. Like so many attacks on civil liberties across the board, including voting rights, this is an all hands on deck moment. This is not a place for compromise and there's no time to spare. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor Dwight. Um, thank you. Uh, to my two lead sponsors, I will identify them as, uh, and also to the to the women who testified and to Reverend Ives as well. The um, just in this bizarre election, uh, the state of Colorado and the state of Louisiana just passed even more draconian restrictions on, on a woman's right to make a choice about her own body. Uh, uh, and, and you know, honestly, there's no. The context, if you put this in context, I mean, there is, as we've often pointed out, there's no equivalent restrictions on a way a male conducts themselves, how they are, there is no law governing our choices in health. There's nothing close, and including, including our reproductive systems. The, I, I think, unfortunately, you know, part of what accounts for Massachusetts current law with its really kind of grotesque language and it's as its standard and the fact that there is a certain complacency there was an understanding that we are a progressive state and we're progressive in all ways um, so for I suppose many people wasn't on their radar and I think for legislators they were given a certain comfort zone while Ruth Bader Ginsburg still walked this planet. That all changed really quickly. The legislature can no longer find comfort in the fact that we have this kind of antique creaky law, but it's still, you know, for them, it's enough right now. It's no longer enough. It wasn't enough to begin with. And it, 
the urgency here is I, I actually is Council Shera and and Council Maori both emphasize is is paramount. We need to establish in in this in this dark time where there has been a systematic dismantling of progressive human rights programming and issues and laws in this country, it is falls upon the states, it falls upon the local communities to actually make the difference. And here is our opportunity, as feeble as it is in some respect, because we're not making a law. We cannot direct anyone to do anything, but we can make an appeal and we can make it a, you know, an unequivocal appeal, an unapologetic appeal for something that pushes us a little closer towards justice and equity and something that is grotesquely inequitable. So I'm, I, I'm glad that we actually get to make our case again. And I do hope that it registers. I hope it. I hope there is a response in the legislature, not just from us, but from, as Council Mayor already pointed out, over three quarters of their constituents have a, have come to expect and believe is the case, and maybe be deluded into thinking that it's it's a robust and solid protection for women, and that the legislators will act as quickly as possible, make it a number one priority to move this through because. As we see, uh, in in insofar in this moment of great uh, unknowing, we don't know who will be presiding over the federal government starting January twentieth, and there's eleven weeks before that time even occurs. We have there's lots of opportunities for even more cruelty and more malevolent acts. And it is imperative that Massachusetts create a, a, a bulwark, a protective layer for the least, at the very least, for the, the most vulnerable here in, in our state, in our Commonwealth. So thank you very much to the co-sponsors. Thank you very much for everyone's testimony. Um, I'm genuinely moved. Other, any other comments? Councillor Nash. I, I wanna thank you, Council President, uh, Councillor Maori and Councillor Dwight for uh, bringing us this resolution. I also wanna thank uh, uh, Representative Sabadosa and Senator Comerford for uh, their efforts around this. And I wanna thank everybody who spoke tonight um, I supported our re resolution back in 2019 and, um, and fully support what we are doing here tonight. Um, I, I really appreciate that during times like this, that it's best for us to do the work that we need to do, that, um, that, uh, that uh, there are things that are out of our control and this is something where we can take control and, and, um, and express our values and, and have it make changes within our Commonwealth with, and, and, uh, and express how we feel here in Northampton. Um, and I, in, during this difficult time, this is exactly what we should be doing and, um, and I completely support this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Foster. I would like to echo the thanks um, to the three co-sponsors of this resolution, um, as well as to those who spoke uh, in favor of it tonight. I remember when the resolution in favor of the Roe Act, um, when city council passed it, I remember being on the hypothetical other side of the microphone um, to speak in front of it. And, um, you know, we, we all know that this pandemic has highlighted shown a spotlight on and exacerbated existing and deepening inequities. And it's an imperative that all residents of Massachusetts, regardless of gender, have access to reproductive health care. 
And that means, as we've talked about and heard about, that it's safe, it's affordable, and it's accessible. And we know that there's barriers to that. And this is something that our state legislature can act on, and I urge them to. Um, I would like to add my voice in support um, that I, I fully support taking action on the ROW Act. It needs to happen sooner than later. Um, and I'm, I'll be proud to vote yes um, with, with my colleagues tonight. Thank you. Any further comments? Councillor Quinlan and Councillor Jarrett. <clears throat> Well, uh, again, uh, thanks so much to the sponsors and to everyone that spoke in public comment. It, it uh, you know, it's just so, um, you know, to kind of get back to uh, the positivity, to feel the community talking about something and, and feeling very similarly about it is is so great and encouraging. Um, you know, I just to uh, looking at this resolution, I, I'm just so impressed with with the the statement of tremendous fact here. Um, you know. Basically, three quarters of adults here in Massachusetts believe in a woman's right to choose. Um, this, you know, this was decided 47 years ago. It's been reaffirmed twice since in 92 and 16. Um, yet here we are uh, fighting uh, to ensure something that was decided a long time ago can can stand. And 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 the fight is is being brought here in the state because we we cannot count on our federal. Uh, you know, offices to do what's right by the people of, of, of America here. Um, you know, the one, the one positive thing I, I have uh, to say is earlier this year, this council together uh, passed a resolution, a resolution urging our state legislator to pass a bill for vote by mail, which was done with great urgency. Why? To ensure safe, healthy voting options. The same urgency is needed now to create safe, healthy options for women's rights, women's reproductive rights. And yet, you know, again, here we are uh, fighting to ensure something that was decided four to seven years ago. It, it's time for our state legislature to act. And so I will join with my colleagues in, in urging them to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Jarrett. Thank you. I think, thank you especially for explaining um, the urgency of the situation um, and, um, I also echo uh, the thanks um, that people, uh, that others have said, um, you know, especially at this time, states need to take the lead and we absolutely need to codify under state law, the rights that uh, have long been fought for. So I will be voting yes. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Thorpe. Thank you. So to go with what everyone else was saying, I echo what everyone else said earlier. I'm I'm happy to support this, and I want to thank you, Council President Sierra, uh, Councilor Dwight, and Councilor Mayori for doing this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any further comments this evening? All right. Seeing none. Roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Lafarge. Yes. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. That passes in first reading. Um, I'd like to ask the council to indulge us in doing a second reading because as we've spent a lot of time talking about, the agency really um, couldn't be stronger. Move to suspend rules to allow for a second reading. Second. second. Motion's been made and seconded by for second reading. Any discussion on second, on motion, okay. Motion's been made and seconded to suspend rules. Any discussion on suspension of rules? Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. And move second reading, please. I get it. Uh, Motion's been made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Labarge on second reading. Any discussion on second reading? 
Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. And Councillor Foster. Yes. Okay. That passes in second reading. Thank you, everybody. Um, next, we move on to the consent agenda. And I'm just gonna close the door because my kids are incoming. So give me a sec. Okay, thank you. Um, consent agenda, I'm gonna read the items and then I'm gonna ask if there are any removals for discussion. I think there might be one. So first up, we have the minutes of July 30th, 2020 special city council meeting and September 17th, 2020th and October 1st, 2020th. Uh, next we have, these are appointments to the arts council. They've received positive recommendations from city services. Um, Kent Alexander, 174 Island Road, term is October, 2020 to June 2023, this is to fill a vacancy. Northampton Housing Authority, Board of Commissioners. Jeff Jones, UFCW Local 1459, Organized Labor Representative, 76 Woods Road. Uh, the term is March 2020 to February 2025. This is a reappointment. Then um, these are appointments for referral to city services. Um, to the Housing Partnership, Ace Taylor, 14 Fruit Street, Apartment 1. Term is November 2020 to June 2023. That's to fill a vacancy. Hannah Schaffer, 115 Milton Street in Florence. Term is November 2020 to June 2023. Uh, That's to fill a vacancy. Um, to Northampton Housing Authority Board of Commissioners, Edgardo Cancel. This is the Northampton Part Housing Partnership appointee. Term November 2020 to June 2023. This is to fill a newly created position on the Northampton Housing Authority Board of Commissioners. Next is 20.147, secondhand dealer license application for feeding tube records. This is a renewal application, um, feeding tube records, 221 Pine Street in Florence. Applicant is Edward Lee. Um, and that, those are the items on the consent agenda. Any removals, Councillor Dwight? Yes, um, I'd like to re uh, remove item 20.147. Okay. Um, so we will remove that. And um, so there's no discussion on the rest of the consent agenda. So um, is I there- I move approval of the remaining items. Okay. Motion's been made by Councillor Dwight. I think seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Um, roll call, please, on the consent agenda, minus that removal. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Okay, that's been approved. So now we're going to take up 20.147 secondhand dealer license application for feeding tube records. Councillor Dwight? Um, I have to recuse myself from this uh, for a possible conflict with a relative. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disappear for a sec. Okay. So Councillor Dwight is recused. Um, is there any discussion? Um, I guess we need a motion in a second for approval. I can make a motion for approval. Second. second. Councillor Labarge made the motion. Councillor Thorpe seconded it. Any discussion on this application? Seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay. That has been approved. And Councillor Dwight can return. And we are now going to recess for finance. 
Laura, when you're ready, can you take the role of finance? Sure. Councillor Labarge. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Yes, here. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Okay. First, we have the approval of minutes um, of September 17th, 2020 and October 1st, 2020. Approved. Second. Motion was made by oh. Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Any discussion on those minutes? Hearing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Um, Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, those are approved. Uh, our first financial order is 20.135 in order to declare surplus and authorized sale of 593 Elm Street. Councillor Thorpe. Councilor Schier, I am recusing myself from this since I am a board member with the CAC, so I'm disappearing. Thank you. Okay, um, of the remaining committee, is there, oh, here, I'll read it and then we'll get a motion. So this is in the City Council on November 5th, 2020, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, um, in order to declare a surplus and authorized sale at 593 Elm Street, ordered that whereas the City of Northampton owns a property located at 593 Elm Street, as shown on Assessor's Map at 23B, Parcel 47, Lot 2, and whereas the City currently leases the property, property to the Children's Advocacy Center, CIC, of Hampshire County, Inc., a private nonprofit providing medical, mental health, victim advocacy, and other services to children and families. And whereas the Children's Advocacy Center of Hampshire County, Inc. is interested in purchasing the property to make it the permanent home of the CAC in advancement of its critical mission of minimizing secondary trauma to child victims by streamlining the handling of cases of sexual, child sexual abuse, serious physical abuse, and child exploitation. And whereas on October 20th, 2020, the Board of Trustees of Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School, after determining that the property was no longer needed for current or future educational purposes, voted to surplus the building to the city. And whereas the city of Northampton does not have a municipal use for the property in Mass General Law Chapter 30B, Section 16, requires a vote of the city council to surplus any interest in public property prior to its disposal. And so now therefore be it ordered the property at 593 Elm Street is declared surplus to city needs and is hereby transferred to the care, custody, and control of the mayor for the purpose of selling such property for continued use for child ad advocacy services in accordance to Massachusetts procurement laws. And on such terms and conditions as the mayor deems reasonable and appropriate, provided that the property shall not be sold for less than its current fair market value, and if sold to a non-profit entity, shall be subject to the successful bidding bidder subject to the successful bidder entering into an agreement for payment in lieu of taxes. Okay. Is there a- Move to approve. Second. Mo motion's been made and seconded. And Mayor Narkowitz, I see you here. Would you like to talk to us about this? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so this is an order that um, I actually sponsored on the Board of Trustees of Smith Vocational as well. The, um, the folks at the CAC, some of whom you've heard from this evening, uh, reached out to me several months ago um, and indicated that they um, uh, were very interested in uh, potentially purchasing the, the building outright. They've been leasing it for several years um, from Smith Vocational um, and have uh, the possibility because of some grant funding to be able to purchase it outright. Um, so we um, brought an order forward to the Board of Trustees, uh, discussed it with the trustees as well as the administration um, at Smith Vocational. It was unanimously um, adopted that they would uh, surplus the property back to the city. Um, and so in order for us to then uh, put it out to uh, to an RFP, it requires the city council to uh, surplus it again, um, uh, uh, surplus it for city uses. Um, this is a great organization, as you've heard during the um, during the public comment session, that does uh, incredibly difficult but vital work in our community, and um, and they've uh, put a lot of investment into this facility. 
um, and the location and um, the services that they provide there um, are critical. And so um, I wanted to help facilitate this as did the board of trustees of Smith Vocational. Um, it's somewhat analogous to other surpluses we've done um, to uh, nonprofits that have been tenants in city property. Um, I can think of um, like the Nonatuck um, School and the old Fiker School or the Community Music Center, which leased for many years the old South Street School um, and eventually reached a point where um, they um, had the resources and it just made more sense for them to own it. And frankly, from the city's perspective, um, it makes more sense for us not to hold on to it as a liability and to just, you know, not, if it's, especially in a school when it's not being used for educational purposes. So, um, so this will all follow the same process that I followed for these other buildings that we've surplused. Um, there'll be a, a, an appraisal done um, and then an RFP will be issued that obviously limits the use of the property to any future buyer, um, in this case for children's advocacy services. And then the pilot agreement is a standard that we've done with all of our um, surplus properties over the years. Um, so I hope, hope that the council will support this. Um, again, it's a great organization and, um, and I think this would be a, a great uh, use for permanent use um, for this uh, particular city owned facility. Thank you. Councilors, discussion. Councilor Quinlan and Councilor Jarrett. Well, I, I thank you for the explanation, uh, Your Honor. The, um, you know, and, and also uh, taking me down memory lane a little as, as my kids both went to Nonatuck and both uh, took lessons at the community music school. Um, but in this particular case, I was just curious about one thing. I, I agree with you. We heard, we heard really terrific public testimony this evening uh, about this organization and the use of this building for that. And I, and I agree wholeheartedly. I'm just curious in terms of the pilot program, how does that work in terms of just in comparing it to what it would be if it was, if it was sold to a private entity and there was taxes on it? Uh, I'm just curious about that, how that compares. So the formula we've been using um, uh, for all of our uh, nonprofits where we sold um, a city building to is we essentially ask them to pay 25% uh, um, of what the um, building would be taxed at if it were um, not owned by a tax exempt property owner. So basically a quarter of what the tax bill would be. Um, you also have to keep in mind that because this building will be owned by a uh, nonprofit and because there's actually a deed restriction on the property that says it can only be used, you know, for this purpose, um, that also has an impact on the value of the property, um, similar to, you know, affordable housing or, or other um, projects. They pay taxes or they're assessed, but obviously um, the assessment uh, uh, factors in, you know, what the, what the, actual market value is. So, um, so yeah, it's 25%. It's something I've discussed already with, um, uh, with uh, the, the CAC folks, they understand that. Um, it's, what, it's what the folks at Community Music School and Nonatuck also agreed to. And it's, uh, it's something that the city's been doing for several years, obviously. We've had long conversations about payment in lieu of taxes and, um, and had hoped that some of our larger tax exempt organizations would uh, participate in a pilot program. Um, but so this is the one way we feel that in, in basically not putting a piece of property back onto the tax rolls, at least captures some, um, some relief or value to the tax base in terms of this, this pilot payment. But yeah, thank you for that explanation. And, and also the, the, the value to the community of having these, these resources available is, is important too, and that's a great investment. The 75% being an investment on the city's part. So thank you. Um, it was Councilor, Le wait, who else had their hand up? <laughs> Councilor, Le okay, Councilor, it was Councilor Jarrett and Councilor LaBarge and Councilor Mayori. Okay, um, thank you. I'm, I'm so glad to understand what the Children's Advocacy Center does and, and I'm glad to support this. And I know about the pilot agreement is this gets us some amount of income while if 
this uh, nonprofit just bought a property, we would not get anything unless we negotiated that. Um, I had a couple of questions. So the city will hold the deed restriction. Um, is that correct? And we could change it in the future if, if for some reason, you know, the Children's Advocacy Center didn't want that property anymore. So what we've um, essentially what we what we do is it's not really a deed restriction necessarily. The the RFP um, well the, the basically what the RFP says is that they will have it'll it can only be used it has to be used for children's advocacy services for the next twenty five years. Um, so it basically bakes in that anyone who you know purchases it um, has to and that's that's a number we've used for the other. Um, similar sales we've done. Um, so it's not really something we hold. It's more of a restriction on the future, on the use of the property. Um, so if it were to be sold or transferred, um, it can only be used for those purposes. And, um, and the CAC folks understand that. Um, so in terms of what would happen if they um, didn't want to honor that, um, you know, that would be something we would then have to, uh, you know, take legal action on. I, I don't really think that that's going to be the case here. Um, and um, so that's, so it's not, it's not exactly like a, like a historic um, a deed restriction uh, or, or um, like a conservation restriction or a, or a historic restriction that's sort of separate and, and above the deed. Um, it's something that's just, that's sort of baked into the sale and they understand that that has to, they have to maintain it for that use for the first 25 years. Mm -hmm. My concern was more, what if they outgrew that space? Um, they're, they're kind of locked in, but I guess that's a decision that they get to make. Um, yeah, no, I think that they've definitely, uh, you know, certainly they have a lease right now, so they could continue to lease it. And I think they're on like their second or third lease, but I think they've made the decision that um, actually it would be... Um, probably free up more resources to just be, to not be a rent payer, but to actually, you know, own the property and have, a, have probably a smaller mortgage than what they're paying in rent. So that's the decision they've made. And, and so we're trying to, trying to honor that. Right. Uh, thank you. My second question is that, does this property have an apartment in it? I know I have constituents uh, at this address or I did a year ago. Um, there is, uh, there's, well, there's not, a, there, there had, uh, over time, there had been um, uh, an apartment upstairs, I believe. Um, but um, but uh, to my knowledge, it's uh, it's not something that it's something that's intermittently, I think, been used. But I believe that um, that in more recent years, it hasn't been used in that in that way. I think the the the, the lease with Smith Vocational actually stipulated that it, that it couldn't be used that way. Um, but, but obviously, if we sell the building outright, uh, that'll, be the that'll be a decision for the CAC whether they want to utilize um, uh, part of it in that way or not. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my concern was, you know, will this be reducing uh, our housing stock in some way if there, if there had been apartments that were rented and wonder if some of the proceeds from the sale could go toward uh, affordable housing? Well, that's yeah, the... the, um, the uh, as I said, it's, it was a sort of an intermittent uh, situation. So I don't think that it's um, part of our permanent stock. And in fact, I'm fairly certain that the folks at Smith Bow said that they didn't want folks living there um, um, because of issues around the building. But um, in terms of the proceeds of the project, um, the proceeds of, of the sale um, must be used for capital expenses. Um, that's sort of a stipulation of sale of, of city property. And, um, and I've pledged that I would um, use those funds for a Smith vocational capital project. Um, just like when we've sold school buildings, we've used the proceeds for a, um, an NPS capital project. So it's not something that we can use for other purposes. It really has to be used for capital. Thank you. Even if we even if we wanted to put it toward affordable housing, we couldn't. Um, we were restricted in terms of sale of land like this. That's for the barge. Mayor, how much land is involved with the house? 
it's not a, it's just a, it's just a building lot. It's, um, it's not a huge, it's, I know it, it sort of sits near the orchard and, you know, the, there's like the, the orchard and then there's an old farm road that takes you up to the, to the school, but really it's a, it's a frontage lot. It's a, you know, probably a standard size lot for that, uh, neighborhood. I, I'm not sure if it's in the order or not. I can't remember if it's, um, there is a parcel ID, but I can't remember if we actually put the, um, Put the acreage but i you know it's it's probably a, a standard lot in that area which you know i don't know um quarter to half acre i'm not sure so my question mayor is i think councillor jarrett had some concerns just say they became bigger and bigger could they actually add on to that house like an addition um, again, it would be their property and they would be, you know, they would be free to do that if they wanted. I, I, um, I don't think that it's on such a small lot that they'd be um, limited from doing that. But again, um, part of this is they, they, you know, I think, I believe they view this as their sort of forever home and they've been there now for, for several leases and it's uh, worked out very well. Um, and so that's why they want to sort of be able to control their own destiny as it were and and own the property and if that means expanding or or putting additions on i think i think cac is a great organization um we heard them talk tonight about it being safe heaven and i have to agree with that so that was my question also was at any point if they became a larger um, private organization, would they be able to add on? So you answered my question. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councilor Mayor was next. Uh, the mayor already answered my question as well. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions? Councilor Miller? Well, I just wanted to follow up on, on what Councilor Jarrett was asking about the proceeds and the mayor mentioned uh, that it would be devoted to a Smith vote capital project. Have you identified a project yet? Is it, is, are there multiple ideas already or, or, or has one no. been selected? Yeah, no, it, I mean, it, uh, typically Smith, um, Smith submits projects as part of the capital um, program. And, and um, we always have projects on our five-year capital plan um, from Smith. And um, I know they've got lots of, they're, they're always, there's always uh, needs um, particularly for some of their older buildings. Um, so I'm you know, sure we'll have no trouble uh, finding projects. We're in the middle of replacing lockers now as part of the capital program. And um, we've done roofs, we've done uh, vans and we've done other, other things for the school. So I'll, we'll work with them to identify um, what their greatest need is. And, and these funds will be put aside for, uh, uh, for funding those projects. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Nash. Memory serves me right. This, this project originally had to do with uh, a construction project with Smith Vogue students that they constructed <laughs> the home. Do I, is, is that right? Um, it's, it's a, it's an old, it's been referred to as the farmhouse. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a farmhouse that's, that, you know, oh, the updating. Did, yeah, they, they definitely students, um, um, uh, have done work in the home, um, at the time that it was being, you know, set up, um, uh, it wasn't built by students, but it was, um, you know, the, there've been several properties and homes gifted to the school over the years. And, um, and so this was a project and, um, I believe students uh, were involved at, at one point in the project. Um, right. I can't tell you more recently. I know it. You know the director of maintenance at the school, Tim Smith. Um, you know does do maintenance there and is responsible for maintenance. And um, so, but yeah, it, yeah quite I possible. saw Councillor Dwight's head nodding. There was yeah. the students were involved. I think in renovations at some point. That and that would I not surprise me of, you know, Smith students working on this property, that it, that it, Northampton and Smith have gone to nurture this program into existence. And here we are, you know, uh, you know, furthering the, the, the existence of that program. I think it's just like, it, it's really wonderful the way the city 
and Smith Folk have all worked together to make this 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 program happen. And so, anyway, I just wanted to note that. Thank you. That's our tweet. Just a quick word, and basically to commend the mayor. I, he, he, in the past, actually, when we surplus properties, there were no associated pilots. In fact, actually, what we kept doing was taking large, significant properties and um, rendering them over to vital nonprofits. But the fact is, is that there was no, the only upside for the city was the reduced liability, no, no longer having to maintain mothball buildings and so on. But it, it started, I think, back with the uh, sale of the old firehouse that's now, that was to Media Education Foundation and Woodstar, um, that they volunteered on the purchase uh, pilot. And it was that at that point that the city decided that maybe that's not a bad idea on all future um, sales to nonprofit systems. So actually, what, and Nonatuck was a perfect example, you have you have valuable assets to the community, but at the same time, there is a cost associated with that had to be borne by the city. That we did uh, gladly and the community was quite generous, but the fact is, is that this economically works so much better. We have, we have essentially an assurance that these, all these institutions are going to remain uh, serving the community. And at the same time, there's an offset with the uh, lost tax revenue. And we also reduce uh, our liability on properties that we, we there's no benefit for, to the city, other than, you know, these lease agreements have become even more complicated. So uh, building into the condition of sale, um, the, the essentially the covenant, and I don't know if that's even be the legal assignment, but that for 25 years, assuring that these these uh, enterprises will stay and continue their missions, uh, and at the same time we get to reap the benefits of their their good work without um, the increased cost to us at, at a time when it becomes harder and harder to meet those costs. So I just uh, give, since I possess a tiny little historical perspective, I wanted to offer that. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah, that definitely there, there, um, uh, there, there are some pilots early on, and, and um, I will say that in more recent years, since um, the uh, the ill-fated launch of my pilot program, where I came up with the twenty-five percent, um, we we've been using that as the formula. So that that sort of morphed into the formula. There were different pilots that were developed for different parcels over time. Um, but we sort of landed on this 25% one and, and that's the one that we've been using. And, you know, this is now, I believe this is now the fourth um, city building that um, my administration has surplused um, that had been previously buildings that we had leased, the old Florence Grammar School. And uh, obviously I mentioned the old Fiker School and South Street School, um, the water department building, um, uh, which is going to Congregation B'nai Israel and now this one, um, which will go to another worthy organization. So I think it's, and these are serving very important community purposes. Councilor Dwight. And, and just to follow up uh, with a ding that the mayor's um, too polite to make actually. But the fact is, is all these agencies, as I said, contribute uh, proportionally a great deal of the community. We have some larger institutions with larger assets that were not so willing to comply or at least accommodate us. And simply we, we can only ask, we can't tell or command or demand, but in this case, the sales of the property, we can actually make a, it a condition of sale. But there are larger agencies that absolutely are very important to our community and contribute to our community. But the fact is, is they don't contribute um, a proportional fund, amount of funds that these smaller um, nonprofits that are that are in most cases wheezing along hoping for the next state grant as opposed to having large deep endowments and and expanding revenue streams I'm just saying I'm not going to mention any by name but they're they're you know it'd be nice if um, they followed their very honest lead 
that's enough, I think. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments, veiled or otherwise? Okay. Seeing none, roll call, please, Laura. Okay. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. That moves forward with a positive recommendation. We will welcome Councillor Thorpe back. And next we have 20.136, in order to make changes to the FY 2021 general fund budget to balance the FY 2021 budget. And okay, this is in the city council, November 5th, 2020, upon the recommendation of the mayor, um, ordered that to balance the fiscal year 2021 budget, the following changes to the FY 2021 general fund budget as passed by the city council on June 18th, 2020, be hereby made. Reduce the amount raised and appropriated from receipts reserved for parking by $350,000. This will reduce the total RRA parking appropriated in the FY 2021 general fund budget from 1,390,873 to 1,042,873. Increase the amount appropriated from the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund by 358,949. This will increase the amount taken from the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund from 52,418 to 411,367. Is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Which is made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Thorpe and Mayor Narkowitz. Yes. Mayor um, so, as you may recall, at various points during this um, during this twenty twenty year, um, and uh, the but even dating back to the budget process, um, I've been indicating that you know we are would likely need to come back to the city council at some point in the future. Um, uh, to true up the budget. Um, we were making our best estimates back in uh, May when we submitted this budget, um, not really knowing what the full extent of COVID-19 would be um, in terms of impacts on, on city revenues, um, as well as the fact that we were doing so without having a state budget um, passed in place. Um, so we didn't actually have a true uh, you know, cherry sheet with revenues that we could count on or use to make our budget with. We were basically um, using, uh, you know, using a, the governor's budget, which had been submitted pre-pandemic, um, and then making, building in some of our own assumptions about what we thought it would do uh, to, to revenues during the pandemic. Um, so fast forward, and we're now at a point where um, in, we need to be able to um, certify that our our budget is um, is balanced, and this is part of where we are as we approach the uh, tax rate process that you um, announced the hearing for in terms of setting the tax rate for FY 2021. Um, we have to be able to uh, show to the state that we're using actual you know revenues and, and we have revenues to support uh, the expenses that are outlined in our budget. Um, as I may have mentioned to you at the last meeting, um, the governor um, sort of a little bit out of the blue because we've been sort of wondering, is there going to be another state budget? Is there going to be a revised state budget? Did finally submit a revised uh, budget uh, for FY 2021, um, sort of updating the budget that he had first submitted back in January, which obviously was pre-COVID. Um, and so he um, uh, uh, that sort of updated our, our um, cherry sheets in, in terms of what our revenues were. Um, and not unsurprisingly, in order to balance the state's budget um, and to be able to maintain uh, services and because of the same drops in revenue, uh, they're relying on uh, funding from what they call their rainy day fund, which is essentially sort of a stabilization fund. So the budget that the governor submitted um, relies on, I think 1.2 billion um, from the state's um, stabilization or rainy day fund. Um, and today the House of Representatives, um, the speaker um, announced um, that they would begin their budget process and, and effectively announced that they would um, use the governor's framework in terms of not seeking new tax revenue, not, not seeking to raise new tax revenue 
um, in the middle of the pandemic, but rather to rely on the use of reserves uh, like the governor had. So, so as we've reported to you over the past several months, and I know the finance director went through uh, the quarterly reports, you've sort of seen some of the way the revenues have fluctuated and um, gone up and gone down in some cases. Um, you know, we've seen some deep drops in revenue, parking, for example. Um, we've seen obviously hotel motel uh, uh, revenues um, come in um, lower than even we had predicted. Um, some, some revenues have actually rebounded um, better than we thought, like ambulance revenues. Um, uh, uh, adult use uh, marijuana actually rebounded um, because they were only closed for a certain, a short period, relatively short period of time. Um, so those have rebounded. Um, and actually our new growth um, has uh, remained quite strong, uh, largely I think because the um, construction industry was not um, really significantly affected. Uh, we and many of the large projects that um, have been underway and were underway um, have progressed. And uh, so, so our new growth was not really affected as well. So what this order basically does, um, and this is for the general fund budget, there's some orders coming after for um, water enterprise and sewer enterprise is, um, is uh, basically uh, make adjustments to our revenue. Um, in one case, we're sort of lowering our, our estimate or draw from the receipt reserve for parking. Um, and, then, uh, and then in the case of the fiscal stability stabilization fund, we're taking um, funding out of that to basically stabilize the general fund budget to basically you know, even out all of those pluses and minuses that um, impacted our overall revenues in order to make sure that we're, we, that the budget we are that we are submitting or that we've already submitted, but we have to have certified by the state um, actually is truly in balance and we can justify that. So that's what these orders do. And, um, and you'll hear a very similar presentation about the water and sewer um, revenues as well. So that's the orders that I'm submitting for you today. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments, Councillor Jarrett. Great. Thank you, uh, Mayor, for the explanation of that. I think it makes a lot of sense to me. It seems very appropriate use of the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund. Um, I'm in favor. Um, but since we are talking about the use of this fund and you know, we may receive orders in the future for additional use, I do think it's appropriate uh, and, and germane to the motion to speak briefly about the money that our reduction in the police budget left in this fund. And uh, my hope that some of that, this money be used to enhance public safety and, and meet the needs of our community. Um, I know that you may uh, employ data-driven decisions. I'm sure that the Northampton Policing Review Commission will deliver on that. Uh, but also there are two re reports that uh, the mayor has commissioned, uh, one on panhandling and the other on affordable housing. And uh, moving on the recommendations from these, uh, I think would help some of the problems we're seeing downtown and elsewhere. And I appreciate all the work that uh, the mayor has done in this area, uh, moving forward on the Resilience Center, for example. Um, and while I can't speak for the council, uh, I want the mayor to know that I would support further funding of these recommendations uh, from this fund. So I wanted to share that, but I also wanna caution us uh, not to deliberate something now uh, that's not on the agenda. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I appreciate that. And um, it's duly noted. And I know at the time that those cuts um, were made by the council, um, I think there was some question about at the time, should I be reallocating them at the time? And I think one of the things I expressed to you, and I think I expressed it publicly, was my apprehension, apprehension knowing that we would likely um, be in a situation later in the year where we would have to use our fiscal stability funds just to balance the budget. So, um, you know, so while we ended up freeing up, uh, you know, 600,000 or so, I don't have the number right in front of me that we didn't have to use from fiscal stability. Um, we're now having to tap into, um, you know, the amount that we're tapping into tonight. So it's not so, so, but, but your, your point is well taken. And obviously those are, those two studies are, um, 
uh, important and we are working to advance them. I know the housing partnership is um, going through those recommendations um, from the fair housing um, analysis and uh, actually you know, working on a, on a guest column in the Gazette that'll be happening pretty soon. And they're, they're working on them in that regard. And then obviously uh, we continue to work to advance the resiliency um, hub initiative and have um, some couple of grants in right now um, to help support that. So, but your, your point is well taken. And obviously um, what I've been telling people is one of the reasons why we appointed the commission that you and Councillor Quinlan serve on is to, um, is to actually get some, some research and some recommendations into, um, into possible alternatives for public safety. So um, hopefully we'll have some of those as we go into the budget season for FY 2022 that we can, that we can talk about and work on. Other questions or comments from the council? Okay, seeing none, um, roll call please, Laura, on a positive recommendation. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that moves forward with a positive recommendation. Next, we have 20.137. In order to rescind and replace FY 2021 Water Enterprise Fund budget, um, upon the recommendation of the mayor, ordered that the budget voted for the Water Enterprise Fund on June 18th, 2020 be rescinded and replaced with the following. The sum of $6,945,000, um, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2021 Water Enterprise Fund budget, July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, be appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation, $5,767,732 is to be raised from water receipts. Sorry about my children. Um, 577,268 shall be allocated to indirect costs and $600,000 shall be transferred from the water stabilization fund. Um, uh, so it's water general is 2,949,566, water debt 1,684,863, water interest 260,190, water indirect costs 577,268, water transfer to capital projects, 1,471,113 um, for that total amount, $6,945,000. Is there motion's been made? Seconded. And seconded, uh, Mayor Narquitz. Mm -hmm. So, um, so again, similar to our um, to our general fund um, revenues, um, this is basically taking the order that um, that was in your FY 2021 budget books for water, and then later for sewer, um, and basically mimic it and mimic it in terms of maintaining the same level of budgetary services. Um, but changing where some of the revenue is coming from. So obviously the 600,000 of the revenue that we had originally anticipated um, would come from water uh, usage fees. Um, it would now come basically out of the stabilization fund uh, for, for the water utility. Um, as probably won't come as a surprise, we've seen some significant drops in water usage from some of our larger customers. Um, You've been reading the newspaper. You've been hearing about this happening in other communities. Um, Amherst, for example, not having UMass fully in session, seeing significant drops um, in their water revenue. Um, for us, to a lesser degree, uh, not having Smith College um, in session has has resulted in um, you know significant reduction in their normal uh, water usage. And you can go across and and look at various other. Um, users, whether it's, you know, the YMCA or athletic clubs that, you know, um, typically have significant water usage, um, but being closed for so many months that did not occur. Um, um, and so even some of our uh, restaurants and some of our retail establishments that were either closed or had limited, um, limited uh, 
hours, also we see reductions there as well. So um, <laughs> the concern is the, the way the revenue is tracking, uh, we, will, we, we, we won't have sufficient revenue from um, Water Enterprise to support, um, to support the budget. So we're gonna use what the, what the stabilization funds are designed for to stabilize the budget um, to get us through FY uh, 2021. Um, and obviously when we flip over to the other enterprise, you know, just know that the sewer uh, rate is set by the water consumption. So people's sewer bills are based on their water consumption. So obviously it stands to reason that if your water consumption is coming in lower than had been projected, that that transfers over to sewer. So um, we're requesting that basically we, um, we use $600,000 of our reserves to, uh, to stabilize the water uh, budget to get us through FY 2021. Thank you. Questions or comments from the council? Hotels are another big one, um, you know, that, that are major water users. You know, think about the Hotel Northampton or think about the, you know, the Fairfield Inn or any of these other hotels, which, you know, people are showering and using the bathrooms. And uh, if they've been closed, that's a significant, uh, that's also a significant um, reduction in water usage. I think the, we're looking at um, some of those bills being, you know, in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 uh, percent below what their normal consumption rate would be. Um, but again, if your hotel is closed, then that that explains it. Okay, Councillor Quinlan. In terms of the six hundred thousand um, dollars, what percentage of the of what's in the stabilization fund is that? How much? How much of it are we using for this? Yeah, on the water um, on the water stabilization, I think I have that written down. Um, it's uh, it still leaves us with quite a healthy balance. Actually, I'm going to ask. Um, see if I can find that here. Um, it's 22% of our, of our uh, water uh, stabilization fund. And, you know, obviously um, uh, uh, every year we generate, there's always some additional funds and we often come to you and say, we want to move that into the water stabilization fund. So I think that, I think that um, fund would be at $2.7 million um, um, after that uh, transfer. Uh, that was where it would leave it. So I think it would still leave us with a fairly healthy uh, balance, I believe. And with the um, with the with the enterprise oh. stabilization funds, do those impact uh, the bond rating as well? I know, and rightfully so. You know, you're pretty proud of the bond rating that we've achieved in Northampton. Uh, and does does this have an impact on that? Should we be thinking about that for the future uh, as well? You know, I think um, you know, I think the the reason why we um, build strong reserves and, and build up our reserve funds is to, you know, be able to weather these types of fluctuations. And so if anything, you know, on the recent bond rating call we had, um, you know, this sort of just affirmed, you know, we were finally in the middle of one of these situations that we're always planning for um, in terms of our reserves. So the fact that we're able to um, not really miss a beat and continue to run the utility um, and be able to, you know, have have healthy reserves that we can tap into. Um, if anything, I think that just enhances our our um, our bond rating. So I don't see it um, affecting it. Obviously, we don't want to get into the habit of using um, uh, of relying too much on the on these funds. But I do think that we're in a very unique situation with COVID, um, and even some of the institutions that. Were closed have now re have since reopened, and I think we're going to see those um, numbers hopefully go back up in the future. So I think this is definitely a, a very isolated COVID related um, incident. I frankly can't believe. I, I mean, I was thinking to myself, well, with everybody home, that maybe the residential water use would have gone up, um, but I'm not sure if we're all showering as much <laughs> or whatever. I'm not sure if people are not showering as much. I'm not really sure what's going on. Maybe they're conserving water, I'm not really sure, but- um, I've noticed several counselors drinking water as you're speaking to try to help oh, okay. the situation. Okay. I think well, we all please, need to go for please. water. Drink faster, we need the, we need the revenue, yeah. so. Then we have to take a recess. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. So I, I just wanna be clear. So 
we had 2.7, um, so it'll be 2.1 after the transfer. So we'll have 2.1 million after the transfer. Okay. Uh, other questions or comments? Okay, roll call please, Laura, on a positive recommendation. Councillor Shara. Yes. Mm. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. <coughs> hey, that a positive recommendation. And next up, we have 20.138 in order to rescind and replace FY 2021 sewer enterprise fund budget. Upon the recommendation of the mayor, ordered that the budget voted for the sewer enterprise fund on June 18, 2020, be rescinded and replaced with the following, the sum of $6,177,500, which is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2021 sewer enterprise fund budget, July 1st, 2020 to June 30th, 2021, be appropriated for the purposes stated and to meet said appropriation, $4,534,674 is to be raised from sewer receipts. $1,042,826 shall be as allocated to indirect costs. $600,000 shall be transferred from the sewer enterprise fund. Um, so those are coming from sewer general sanitary, $1,051,250. Sewer treatment, $2,270,734. Sewer debt, $209,235. Sewer interest, $61,804. Sewer indirect cost, $1,042,826. Sewer transfer to capital funds, capital projects, uh, $1,594,651 for that total. Uh, is there a motion? Move to approve, please. Motion's been made. Second? So, was there a second? I think it. I made the first motion. <laughs> I'll second. Okay. The motion's been made and seconded perhaps many times now. Um, Mayor Narkowitz. Um, again, same, same scenario. Um, we do just to uh, maybe anticipate Councillor Quinlan's question um, in terms of what this represents from our reserves. We, we have much larger sewer reserves because we've been. Um, building them up for some of the large projects we have, including, you know, we're in the middle of an $11.5 million upgrade to the wastewater treatment plan. And we've got a number of other large uh, projects. So in the 600,000 represents um, only 5% of our, of our stabilization fund. So, um, so we will, we still maintain very healthy balances for those large capital projects we've been planning for. But again, um, this is the goal is to, to stabilize the utility during this, um, during this COVID related downturn. Other, Councillor Quinlan still got one for you. <laughs> just, no problem. Uh, I just, you know, in terms of those large projects that, you know, using some of this 600,000, you said it's 5%, uh, they'll, those projects will continue as planned? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And, um, you know, you, you, you may have seen that we, um, there's a new sign up at the wastewater treatment plant um, because we did receive the, um, the state uh, uh, clean water trust funding or, or loan, uh, low interest loan on the project. Um, and they make you put up a sign. It's sort of like part of it. It's like the CPA, they make you put up a sign, you know, saying this project funded by. Um, so that's gonna save us significantly in terms of um, interest payments. And we're even gonna get a little bit of it forgiven um, as part of the project as well. But, um, but we still have, if you look at the capital uh, plan, we've still got many other phases uh, in terms of um, sewer upgrades to do. So having a down payment and a way to not have to necessarily borrow all of it, um, but having some cap, some actual cash to put towards some of these projects would be very, will be very helpful, which is why we've been making sure we build up our, our reserves in the sewer utility. Great, thank you. Councillor Nash. You're muted. You're muted. Well, I said thank you and <laughs> thank you, Council President, uh, Mayor. Uh, so, so with this dirt downturn in water usage and sewer usage, has it resulted in any changes in the way those two facilities work or, um, or you know, I guess you know what I'm saying is that if there's such a downturn, 
Are there any savings there? Or are there different ways that these facilities operate? Um, or you just keep pumping out water and yeah. processing? No. Yeah, no, really, the, these are 24 seven processing uh, facilities, um, obviously on opposite ends of the, uh, the water uh, story. Um, and so, no, it really doesn't, um, doesn't really impact that. We've still got to, you know, many of you counselors who went on the tours of both facilities, you know, all of the same uh, testing has to occur and all the same monitoring of uh, pressure and monitoring of the uh, reservoirs and wells and all those things um, happen. So, you know, this is still a, a major um, utility that's, that's handling uh, many millions and millions of gallons. Um, and so, you know, it, it doesn't really, uh, we can't really shut things down or shut parts of it down or any of those kinds of things. Um, and then obviously on the, on the, um, on the stormwater side, we're, you know, we're basically, this is the final stop before our sewage goes into the Connecticut River. And so we have to, we have to do all the work in terms of purifying it and, and, you know, taking that brown beaker that you saw and turning it into the clear beaker that you saw before it, before it does go out into the river. So there's really not savings to be found because of this. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. And Councillor Shara? Yes. Okay, oh, Councillor Jarrett? Uh, I'd like to request a short recess. Okay. Um, what time is it? Let's come back at, let's say, <laughs> Uh, 9.20. Let's all use the facilities so we can get that yes. rubbish back. <laughs> Lift it up. Okay.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. We are still in finance committee. And we are up to 20.140 in order to surplus land to abutters at Woodland Drive. Um, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and planning and sustainability. Whereas on April 6, 2020, City Council authorized the city to accept a deed for 1.906 plus or minus acres on Woodland Drive map ID 42-131 for an affordable home, a workforce or market rate home and a future walking and bicycling path, which the city acquired on May 13, 2020, book 13526, page 315. Whereas in conducting due diligence, there are one or more slivers of land which are not necessary for the above purposes and which could be sold to abutters if mutually agreeable terms could be worked out. Ordered that, City Council declares such slivers of land surplus to city needs and this mayor is authorized to transfer deeds for such surplus land. Further related or unrelated to selling such land, if the city is able to acquire deed or easements to extend the above reference trail further east, the mayor is authorized to accept said deed or easements. Motion, please. Motion to approve. Second. Motion's been made by Councillor Quinlan, seconded by Councillor Thor. <laughs> one. Other way around. Other way around. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, made by Councillor Thorpe, seconded by Councillor Quinlan. Um, Mayor Merkwitz. I'm actually, um, I'm actually going to defer to um, our Director of Planning and Sustainability, um, Wayne Feiden, who's an expert in land slivers. So he, <laughs> uh, he can. Please educate us on the sliver. Yes. Sure. I don't know if you noticed when, when Laura put the view up, the ordinance up, but um, the property sort of shaped like a flagpole with a very short, I mean, the flag with a very short flagpole. That flagpole does us no good whatsoever. Um, it would give the homeowners, the new homeowners, the responsibility to clear snow and the abutter is very interested in getting that property. Um, so we would sell the land to the abutter, just that flagpole, and then we'd be left with the, the square land. Um, that's the only one which we know we want to do, but as we lay out homes and do more details, there could be an additional sliver of property, which we'd also want to sell. Um, and then the northerly part of the property, um, the original order allowed us to save an easement or some right of way in case we want to build a future trail. Um, if a neighbor is willing to give us a portion of their property or sell us a portion of the property, you'd be granting us the right to buy that. That may or may not ever happen. We're just... This will give us the authority so we could negotiate. Great. Any questions or comments? Councilor Labarge. Wayne, on the so-called sliver, the, is it a flagpole lot that you're talking about the sliver? Or what is it, just a flagpole? Yeah, I mean, it's not a normal, it's not a flag lot, it's an illegal flag lot, but the property itself narrows down to, I don't know, something like 15 feet wide. Um, for a portion of land, so that 15 feet doesn't do us any good. Are you talking about the um, first house on the corner? That's correct. The, the land I'm between that first house and Woodland Drive. Okay. Have you had um, the surveyors out there yet to making a determination on the property and so forth with the city? No, we want to, ha we want to have your vote first because where we draw that line will depend on whether you give us authority or not. I didn't want to spend money on survey and then not be able to go forward. Okay, and the other sliver, where is that located? Well, the, the same property owner who has, whose fronts on, on West Hampton Road, he would like to buy some land behind his home that we're not ready to agree to yet because we have to lay out the lot. But, you know, if we can make it work and make him happy, we'd like to, but if we can't, we may not be able to go there. Is that to give the city the opportunity to have the trails go through or? No, that, that piece would, that extra sliver would really be to allow the neighbors to buy some land as a buffer for them okay. to protect. Okay, all right, I understand that. Thank you, Wayne. Other questions? Okay, seeing none, roll call please, Laura, on a positive recommendation. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. 
Yes. Okay, that moves forward with the positive recommendation. And we are at 20.141 in order to accept $10,000, a $10,000 gift from DA Sullivan for senior services technology lending program. Uh, upon the recommendation of the mayor, ordered that the Northampton City Council gratefully accepts the donation of $10,000, a gift to the city of Northampton from DA Sullivan and Sons, Inc. In accordance with Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 44, Section 53A, approves using the gifted funds for equipment and training services in support of the Senior Services Technology Lending Program created in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Move to approve. Second. Motion has been made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. And Mayor? Uh, yes, thank you, um, Councillor. Uh, this is, um, this is an, another in a series of gifts that uh, the Sullivan family has um, been making um, on an annual basis to the city um, to fund various um, projects, either in schools or recreation or in this case um, senior services and um, in speaking with uh, Mark Sullivan this year about how um, best the gift could be used um, we talked a little bit about the efforts that uh, you know Marie Westberg and her staff have been doing um, to um, work with seniors who don't have access to technology um, obviously they've been doing a lot of programming now via Zoom, like we're having this meeting and, um, and uh, teaching folks how to use Zoom to be able to, to get onto classes or even just, even just discussions um, or an opportunity to be able to just chat with other seniors. And so they've um, gotten some small um, grants already to try to purchase devices that then they can lend out to seniors, including hotspots. And so, um, the idea behind this gift was to be able to actually, you know, establish a fund that uh, senior services could use to purchase more devices going forward and, you know, replace devices and purchase hotspots and um, be able to work um, to get technology um, in the hands of seniors who may not be able to, um, to afford it in the near term. Uh, and again, this sort of has grown out of um, COVID-19 and, and, um, the, the new reality that uh, our most vulnerable uh, population um, who can't be safely congregating um, in person, this allows them an opportunity to do that virtually. So generous, thank you. Actually, Councillor Nash and I had had a conversation with, um, with Wayne actually about different possibilities for trying to expand that sort of access particularly for seniors. So this is just so, so generous of DA Sullivan as always. Um, I, saw, I saw hands, uh, Councilor LaBarge, then Councilor Nash. Um, I wanna thank um, the DA Sullivan and sons and family. Um, they donated all our guests in the municipal building. Um, I don't know what else they have donated, but this is this family, I commend them because even, I think Mark was on the planning board, wasn't he, Mayor, at that point? Yep, he was the longtime chair for many years before he um, stepped down recently. And you're correct, they uh, donated um, the, the desks in the council chambers, which are gathering dust low these uh, seven or eight months. Um, they also more recently um, donated the um, fully handicapped accessible uh, water fountain in Pulaski Park that uh, we installed um, to retro and, and the water bottle filling station. Um, they've also contributed to uh, playground projects at, at schools. Um, and it's just, they, they feel really strongly about giving back to the community. And so um, every year we, they check in about what are the types of projects that they could support. So this year it felt like supporting seniors in this way was a good use. Right, I wanna thank them and commend them for helping our city as a business. And I wish many more businesses would come forth and be like the Sullivan family. They, they are just unbelievable. Councilor Nash. Yeah, I, I, I want to thank the Sullivan family and 
uh, for this donation and for this conversation because um, I, like Councillor Shara, am having one of those connect the dots moment of like, oh, there is a program <laughs> because there's there's a person we've been um, helping support to access these meetings. And I'm going to be reaching out to uh, Marie Westberg tomorrow about seeing if this particular <laughs> senior could benefit from this program. So thank you. You're welcome, and we uh, we and we also not only provide the devices, but they've been um, they've got some folks who are helping do uh, training and and tech sort of tech support, if you will, for helping walking people through how to how to use and connect and set up hotspots, etc. So, for this particular individual, it would be a huge relief to have access to public meetings um, that um, we've been working all sorts of ways to accommodate this individual so they can participate. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, hey, that moves forward with a positive recommendation. And we're at 20.142 in order to appropriate transportation infrastructure enhancement funds to Pine Street Bridge reconstruction, whereas the city has received $18,148.20 from the Commonwealth Transportation Infrastructure Enhancement, Enhancement Trust Fund for trips conducted by transportation network companies in Massachusetts for calendar year 2018 and 2018 and 2019. And whereas the funds must be appropriated by city council upon the recommendation and approval of the mayor. And whereas the funds must be used to address the impact of transportation network services on municipal roads, bridges, and other transportation infrastructure, or any other public purpose substantially related to the operation of transportation network services in the city or town, order that the amount of $18,148.20 be appropriated from the Commonwealth Transportation Infrastructure Enhancement Fund, Fund 2316, to be used for the cost related to the reconstruction of the Pine Street Bridge. Is there a motion? Motion was made by Councillor Thorpe, I think. Quinlan. Second by me. Quinlan. And seconded by Councillor Quinlan. Um, Mayor Nerkowitz. So, um, so this is um, uh, sort of the third year of receiving this money. This is um, basically there's a there's a fee that's collected uh, when people do uh, ride sharing. Um, and, um, and it comes back to municipalities and it can be, it's to be used basically for uh, your transportation system. And the whole idea is that, you know, um, as, you know, as, as, as well adopted as ride sharing became um, with Uber and, and Lyft and these other services, um, it's pretty well recognized that the downside is that it's meant more, many more single vehicle trips on our roadways and um, obviously causing congestion and, um, and obviously contributing to greenhouse gases, but also um, just causing um, wear and tear on our infrastructure. So we've been, um, so I think the, the, the first installment of it, we used it towards some paving, um, toward our paving fund, again, relatively small amount of money. Um, this, um, this year, uh, we've been doing some work on the Pine Street Bridge. Uh, you may recall we came to you, I don't remember even now what month it was, but um, we've had to make some, um, some repairs following an inspection to the Pine Street Bridge. And um, so in talking to the DBW director about the most sort of pressing um, need and some costs that she has right now that this money could pay for, um, the Pine Street Bridge project seemed to be the most imminent in terms of a, of a transportation infrastructure project where we could put this money uh, to use immediately. So I'm essentially requesting, and we have to show the state um, that we're actually appropriating it to a transportation you know, related project. So that's why I'm making this request that it, we're basically taking two years of it um, and sort of bundling it and, uh, and appropriating it to the Pine Street Bridge project. 
And, and the other, the only other question, I think it might be on the, I'm not sure if we put it on the agenda, but if it's, if it's possible to request two readings uh, in the main meeting only because um, there's this, some of this work is, is uh, winter sensitive and the director would like to, would like to get, the, but that's more a question for the main meeting. I can't remember if we put that on the order or not, but. The request is on the agenda, so. Excellent, great. Um, questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Nash. Mayor, where is the Pine Street Bridge? <laughs> oh, um, it's, you know, when you're, uh, well, when you're on Pine Street, you know, when you're heading down from the center of Florence and you go past the Sojourner Truth Memorial and you go right. past Great Wall um, and it's that little bridge, you may not even notice oh, it's a bridge, okay. but yeah, right, that takes you, you know, over the Mill River and, and to the intersection of Spring Street and, and, uh, Florence Road. Um, yeah, so it's right there. Like, thank you. Yep. Um, but it's, it's a. How old is that bridge? What's that? How old is that bridge? Hmm, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't know. I can look it up. Um, I don't, I don't, I have a lot of, a lot of my head is filled with lots of facts. Some, some of them helpful, some of them useless. That's one I don't have at the tip of my tongue. So. Uh, but we can certainly look it up. But it's been a bridge that we've done some work on. We had to do some resurfacing a few years ago. You may remember. It's kind of a, it's a small bridge, but it's a pain to shut down because it's such a such a heavily traveled route to your ward and to other wards. But um, but there's a you may have remembered that there were a couple of um, steel beam ends that were deteriorated that got picked up on a state inspection. So we've been doing a lot of, a number of repair work to the bridge. Fortunately, we haven't had to close it for that, but, um, but we've been doing that to try to bring it back into compliance. I can find that out for you and, and get it to you. Whenever. Okay. It's water under the bridge, right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right. Any other questions or comments? Corny jokes. I'll be here all week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay, that moves forward with a positive recommendation and we are at 20.143 in order to appropriate $3,000 in CPA funds for construction of Pine Grove Trails. This is upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee ordered that whereas the Office of Planning, Sustainability and Conservation Commission submitted a small grants application for construction of a trail connection from Old Wilson Road to create public access to the Pine Grove section of the Rocky Hill Greenway. Whereas the project meets the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan, Northampton Community Preservation Plan, an open space recreation and multi-use trail to provide for passive recreation and promote further exploration and contributes to public health by encouraging walking and hiking. Whereas on October 7, 2020, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $3,000 in Community Pres Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $3,000 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to the Pine Grove Trail Creation Project, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Specifically, $3,000 is appropriated from the CPA Open Space Reserve account. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. Motion was made by Councilor Lavard, seconded by Councilor Thorpe, and Sarah Lavalley is here. Hey, Sarah. All right. Uh, so the the community preservation has begun. Committee has begun reviewing applications for the fall funding round, and there has they have two initial recommendations from the small grants and expedited review process, in advance of the other recommendations that are going to be coming before you later this winter. Uh, and the first of these is the is the Pine Grove Trails project that's in front of you now as a small grant recommendation. So over the past several years, the, the city in partnership with Mass Audubon has created the Rocky Hill Greenway, which is a 200 plus acre wildlife corridor that's part of an open space network that extends from the Connecticut River Oxbow and Arcadia Wildlife Sanctuary to the western part of the city. 
Uh, and when, when I first started working here about 10 years ago, this greenway didn't exist. So this is brand new and it's really exciting. And the most recent acquisition in the Rocky Hill Greenway is the Pine Grove Golf Course, which is currently in the process of being restored and reforested uh, with the help of Community Preservation Act and also state grants. Um, so when the area was a golf course, it was easily accessible through the parking area and existing cart paths. You know, you could park at the parking lot and, and just walk out anywhere. Um, the, but the parking area and the clubhouse remain in private ownership and is being developed. So that's no longer a viable access point. And the previous access isn't available anymore. And in addition, the fairways that were um, mown re regularly and were easily accessible are no longer being mowed and maintained and a dedicated trail system is being created for easy public access. Uh, there's lots of cart paths on the property, so this is a lot easier than uh, most of the properties that we work with. But this initial small grant application to the Office of Planning and Sustainability will allow a trail to be created from Old Wilson Road to connect to that cart path network, which will then also collect to the larger Rocky Hill Greenway. Thank you for that explanation. Are there questions or comments? Question. Councillor Labarge. Yeah. Sarah, the um, property to the right where the Gulf Coast um, houses and there's what one, the there's a house below. All those lots, four lots have been sold, correct? Uh, yes. So those were retained by in private ownership and right. aren't they're aren't sold. owned by the city. So they're sold. Yes. All right, so this $3,000 we're looking at now doing the trails because I, I, yeah, have, so. because I have friends that live on Pine Valley. And where are you going to start this? Uh, so this initial trail will connect from um, just uh, northeast of the, the current brook. Uh, to the, the cart path system. So as the, the fairways are growing in, there's not a, a great access point currently for people to get to the rest of the property. So this will allow them to easily access that. Okay. I know at one point there were tons of turkeys out there and deers. And when I had talked with Wayne about that, because they're absolutely beautiful out there. Lately, we haven't been seeing them. And he said, once we start revitalizing that property, the wetlands out there, they'll bring them all back again. They'll all come back. So I was happy to hear that. Great, more turkeys and deers. Um, who, uh, any other questions, comments? Roll call, please, Laura. Thank you, Sarah. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. Okay, that moves forward with a positive recommendation. And we're at 20.144 in order to appropriate $65,000 in CPA funds for water based recreation assessment project. Upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee ordered that whereas the Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted an expedited application for a feasibility study to assess existing informal swimming areas on the Mill and Connecticut rivers, identify possible improvements and create preliminary designs for such improvements sufficient to apply for outside grants. Whereas the project meets high priority goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan, Northampton Community Preservation Plan, and Open Space Recreation and Multi-Use Trail Plan by furthering creation of water-based recreation facilities. Whereas on October 21st, 2020, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted to recommend that $65,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $65,000 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to the water-based recreation assessment project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Specifically, $65,000 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve. Okay, motion, please. Motion. Seconded. Motion's been made by Councilor Labarge and seconded by Councilor Thorpe, I think. Um, and Sarah, would you like to talk about this? Sure. So I, Wayne, I, I believe is still here and yep. should be available to answer detailed questions about the larger project, but I'll give you a um, summary of the CPA process. 
Um, so as I mentioned, the CPA usually recommends projects in a, um, a bundle of recommendations that come before you later in the winter. Uh, the, the two ways that projects can come before you sooner are the small grants process, uh, which is a little bit simpler and also expedited review, which is a way that um, applicants who have a, a time sensitive issue can begin to move forward with their projects a little bit faster. So uh, the Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted an application to begin moving forward with a water recreation assessment to start looking at um, some of the informal swimming areas in the city and the, the need that has really been called out, especially this summer with COVID for, the, for additional swimming areas and opportunities there uh, to hopefully be ready for grant applications next summer. Great, thank you. Um, any, any questions or comments? Uh, Councilor Nash. This is so great, so timely. We, you know, I, I, and I know other counselors who have sat in on meetings around this are really excited that we're moving forward with having, um, you know, these plans made and nice work um, to, to both you, Sarah and Wayne and get in the planning department. Thank you. Councillor Labarge. Yes, I am very pleased. Um, I've even talked to Wayne about this. Um, this is an absolutely necessary um, assessment that we need to have done. And um, I think with Sarah and Wayne and the CPA money, it's going to come a long way. And I think working very tirelessly on this, and we're going to solve the problems that we've had throughout the summer. And um, I support this. Okay, other, uh, Councillor Jarrett. Um, yeah, thank you for your work on this. Um, Ward 5 has certainly seen the increase in the use of water-based recreation and the conflicts that can occur and um, fully in support of the long-term work, which I think will bring a bigger variety of opportunities and um, and in those opportunities, including in those opportunities, those that don't require payment um, so that there, there can be uh, accessibility for all. Thank you. Councillor Mayory. Yes, as you all know, we've uh, definitely struggled in, in needs over the summer um, with uh, rec recreational um, issues and having um, kind of kind of proper and formal sites so that uh, they can be more planful and the use of them can be more planful. I, I do hope, um, you know, that we have river, I think river stewards um, eventually in our city around these, I think it's actually a quite cost effective um, and kind of a culturally informed way to deal with um, some of the issues that are coming up around um, trash and usage um, I would like to, I would be curious to eventually see a breakdown of, of the, where the money went, uh, will be going specifically. Uh, is that, is that part, I guess, uh, Wayne, I could look at the proposal at some point or. Yeah, I mean, remember this is only study money and it's only get to the first step of applying for grants. So it'd be okay. for a single firm, it would be all to a landscape architect and an engineering firm, landscape architect to help with the visioning and engineer to help with enough of a plan that we could apply for grants. Um, exactly what the mix will be between sort of the four mill river sites that we're talking at simple interventions and the Connecticut River, which could be deeper yeah. intervention. I'm not sure in terms of the hours that would go into both, but it would be one contract with a vendor. Okay, I see. Thank you, that's helpful. Yes, I'm really glad for this and I thought your, um, presentation was really detailed and, and thoughtful. I see another hand. Okay. Uh, this is definitely an excite, exciting step forward. Um, all right, roll call please, Laura. The part. 
Councilor LaBarge, I don't know if we can hear you. I didn't hear her. Oh, yeah. sorry, Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Okay. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Great, <laughs> that um, moves forward with the positive recommendation. And that brings us to the end of the finance agenda. Is there a motion? To adjourn motion. finance. Motion second. Made and seconded to adjourn finance. Roll call, please, Laura, on adjourning. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, we've adjourned finance and we're back in council. And here we are again. Um, we're at 20.135 in order to declare surplus and authorize sale of 593 Elm Street. So again, okay. Councillor Thorpe has recused himself um, and this is on first reading. Move to approve. Motions have been made by okay. Councillor Labarge and seconded okay. by Councillor Jarrett. Um, any discussion on first reading? Okay, roll call, please, Laura. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. And Councilor Shara. Yes. That passes in first reading and we're at 20.136 in order to make changes to the FY 2021 general fund budget to balance the FY 2021 budget. Move to approve. Move. Second. Motions been made by Councilor Debarge, seconded by Councilor Dwight. Any discussion on this first reading? Okay, roll call please, Laura. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. And Councilor Dwight. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading and we are at 20.137 in order to rescind and replace FY 2021 Water Enterprise Fund budget. Move to approve. Second. Second. Motion was made by Councilor Labarge and I'm not sure there was a I duet. Of, <laughs> okay. Um, discussion on first reading. Roll call please, Laura. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. <laughs> and Councillor Foster. Yes. All right, that passes in first reading. We're gonna ask you not to gesture on the next one, which is 20.138, in order to rescind and replace FY20 sewer <laughs> enterprise fund budget. First reading, was there a motion? Uh, so moved. Second. I'll second it. <laughs> oh dear. Um, a motion's been made and seconded. Discussion. Roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Mr. Quinlan? Yes. Okay. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Oh, yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. All right, that passes in first reading. Next is 20.140 in order to surplus land to abutters at Woodland Drive. Move to approve. 
Second. Seconded by who? Who was it? Fess up. Whoever wants it. I said it. Third so. <laughs> Corp. Okay. Discussion on first reading. Uh, Councilor Jarrett. Um, is uh, Director Fiden still with us? Hmm. Yes. Um, I noticed uh, that I just looked on the street view of this area, noticed that this sliver of land does have a number of trees on it. They're not that big. Um, I guess, is there any concern with the, that the new owners may down those trees or, or just, you know, that sounds like that, you know, if we sold that, they would have the right to do that. Um, so just wanted to, to raise that issue and we we didn't have any conversation about the trees. I know that they generally are interested in this just to protect themselves. So they were worried if the land was sold to someone else that they that they might be exposed. So as far as I know, they have no plans, but I didn't discuss it with them specifically. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments? Okay, roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Mayori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. And Councillor Labarge. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. 20.141 in order to accept $10,000 gift from DA Sullivan for Senior Services Technology Lending Program. Motion. Approval, please. Second. Made by Councillor Dwight and seconded by Councillor Labarge. Discussion on first reading. Councillor Foster. I just wanted to echo the gratitude I heard in the committee meeting um, of the generosity from the Sullivan family. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. Thank you. Any other questions or comments or discussion? Okay, roll call please on this generous gift. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. And Councillor Maori. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. And we are at 20.142 in order to appropriate transportation infrastructure enhancement funds to Pine Street Bridge reconstruction. Move to approve. Motion's been made by Councillor Labarge. Seconded Second. by Councillor Maori. Seconded, seconded by Councillor Maori. Um, <laughs> Discussion on first reading. Okay. Hearing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Nat, uh, Maori. Yes. And Councillor Nash. Yes. Okay, that passes on first reading and there's a request. Uh, uh, I'm second. Motion Whatever that was. And by <laughs> Councillor LeBar, second by Councillor Dwight to suspend rules. Discussion on suspension of rules. Roll call on suspending rules, please, Laura. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Rose are suspended. Move second reading, please. Move second reading, please. By Councillor Dwight. Second. Seconded by Councillor Foster. Discussion on second reading. Roll call, please, Laura. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. 
Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. And Councillor Shara. Yes. That passes into readings. And we are at 20.143 in order to appropriate $3,000 in CPA funds for construction of Pine Grove Trails. Move to approve. Second. Motion made by Councillor Labarge, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Discussion? Seeing none, roll call please, Laura. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yeah. Oh, yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading and we're at 20.144 in order to appropriate $65,000 in CPA funds for water-based recreation assessment project. Mm -hmm. Councillor Foster. Yes, uh, I'm going to need to recuse from this discussion as the executive director of All Out Adventures, we run regular programs and hold a permit to work at one of the locations under consideration here. Thank you. So Councilor Foster um, herself. Move to approve. Second. Second. Motions made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Discussion. Okay, roll call please. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. And now we're moving on to financial orders on second reading. We have 20.134 in order to appropriate funds to complete the stormwater analysis Beaver Brook Estates in Leeds. Councilor Sierra, I need to recuse myself, please. Councilor LaBarge is recused. Um, uh, move approval, please. Motion's been made by Councilor Dwight. Second. Seconded by Councilor Foster. Discussion. Councilor Quinlan. You know, um, so Mr. Melnick was here tonight in public comment, and I was kind of was thinking a lot about what he was saying in terms of uh, that this maybe wasn't a council issue. So I'm really was thinking back on in March and April, we had a pretty great discussion about changing a zoning ordinance around non-conforming lots. And one of the arguments made was that we would be as a council leaning on the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Zoning Board to uh, take a little firmer look at some things before they pass them off to us. So I'm curious about the rest of the council, what you think here, because um, it's given me pause to think about this. Uh, we, I read the emails this week from Mr. Melnick and then the follow-up from our DPW director, and I thought the DPW director's response was, was very appropriate. I thought that it was correct. Um, but again, I wondered if, based on Mr. Melnick's um, comment earlier, if this wasn't something that another uh, board should be taking a little sharper look at than us. Um, Mayor Northwoods, did you want to respond? Um, I just was just reminding folks that you know, by statute, you're the only, you are the you are the body that that um, controls. Um, this fund or the ability to take money out of this fund. And I mean, we do have a zoning board of appeals and we do have other planning bodies, but this is, you know, this is the, you're the only body that can adjudicate this particular issue that you're being asked to adjudicate. You're not being asked to roll, rule on zoning or rule on anything other than just um, allowing the planning board to access these funds um, to try to make sure that the homeowners who purchase, you know, these properties in this development have a functioning stormwater system that can actually be certified. So um, similar to what you've done, what you did more recently with the North, um, with the project up on Village Hill, 
um, where the developer left sort of uh, a project unfinished um, and sort of left the neighbors, or the neighborhood or those who were there with, with a problematic system. And so we basically had to step in and, and, and address it. So, um, but we do have Donald Escalia on the call and we do have uh, Mr. Fiden on the call. Um, so if there are other questions, and I, again, I would, I just would, um, I know that the attor attorney um, uh, Melnick said that this is not your, you shouldn't be in, involved in this, but actually you're the only one, you're the only authority that can be involved in this particular question. Um, and again, there's precedent, you know, just several months ago with the project at Village Hill. Um, I see Councillor Jarrett and then Councillor Nash. Um, could, would anyone be able to explain what Mr. Melnick is talking about as far as the zoning board and the courts? Uh, yeah. Well, I think that um, obviously um, the issue, I, I'm, I'm, I'm unclear about the, I mean, the zoning board typically um, is a place you go if there is a, um, typically a rule, rulings of the building inspector are, can be appealed to the zoning board. Um, you know, obviously the zoning board um, does, um, uh, you know, issue, issue findings and other, other matters within their jurisdiction, but most as in terms of their true appellate role, it's usually rulings of the building inspector that can be brought to the um, to the zoning board. I, I really think that this would ultimately be a court matter. Um, uh, you know, he mentioned going to superior court and that's his right, obviously, to do that at any point. Um, but from from the city's perspective, you know, he was issued a permit, a duly issued permit that had requirements and um, and uh, you know, he, I know that he referred to his engineer, um, but actually that's, that's one of, that's sort of at the heart of the matter here is that we require um, an actual engineer stamped, you know, certified um, uh, responses to the things we need to understand. And to date, he has not produced that. And, um, and so that's really where we're at odds. And so, um, again, I'm not really sure what the where the litigation would would come in, but obviously you can you can litigate anything. Um, so you can go to Superior Court over just about anything. Mr. Fiden may be able to answer that from a zoning uh, question in terms of how the ZBA would would work here. So I could defer to him on that. Yeah, every, everything the mayor said is absolutely correct. I just want to expand in one area. So if he was going to file some sort of legal action, it would be based on the planning board's action. Um, the problem, is, and, and as the mayor said, this is almost identical to Northview in the sense of we rarely take performance guarantees, but when a developer isn't delivering what they have to do, that's when we, we do that. The, there's one difference between this and Northview, which is um, we typically notify an app, but we notify a property owner when we're going to take the, the, the money that we hold in, in trust for them. In the case of Northview, the action that we took to collect the money was to write Florence Bank and make a demand that the performance guarantee be turned over to the city. And planning board can do that without going to city council. So the, the final definitive piece was to give that demand. And before we did that demand, or actually we, we wrote the Florence Bank and said, we plan to call this in, I think it's 30 days, unless the developer completes the project developer didn't do that and we called it and then we came to city council for the right to spend the money. The, the only difference in this case is we already hold the money. So the normal, you know, Pat Mellick specifically asked for a definitive statement from the city. We can't do that without your authority because right now we already hold the money and he can come before the planning board and the planning board says no, but he could come back the next day with a revised plan. So the planning board can basically never give a definitive statement because they already hold the money. So the only definitive action is to actually have authority to spend the money. So that, so, so to be clear, I mean, there's a, a challenge in court, and I'm not a lawyer, but there's a challenge of 
you have to exhaust your administrative remedies before you go to court. His ah. administrative remedy is to come back to the planning board every single week and say, can you release me now? And the planning board is gonna say no, but they're never gonna say you, we wouldn't release it next week. You could come back with more information. So the definitive statement is when we say, we now have the authority to spend your money, we will spend the money in 14 days or 21 days or 30 days, unless you collect this process, unless you, you correct the problem. So, so uh, Director Feid, are you saying that for him to pursue courts, he would actually, this would actually have to happen first, uh, this uh, council vote? Or? I, I don't know, I and mean, I can't speak, yeah. I, you know, I'm a lawyer, so I can't speak where they could go to court, but his specific request to you in public comment was a definitive denial letter. I don't think we could issue that letter. Ah, okay. It has to exhaust you. the remedy. It has to make one change. Thank you. Councilor Nash. Thank you, Council President. Um, so I, I just want to say that based on the documentation provided by Director Lascalia and um, just the my awareness of the history of what's gone on here, I'm inclined to <laughs> release funds to vote to release these funds tonight. The only my only concern is uh, based on uh, Mr. Melnick's account that he only learned about this later in the process. Um, makes me, it, that's his claim, and that uh, makes me wonder if that, if we voted to continue tonight, uh, that we, it would provide an, an additional two weeks. And I wonder if uh, either the mayor or Wayne or uh, Mr. Fiden or Director Lascalia thinks that any additional time like that might bring about a resolution because we have a bit, it, I, I interpret this as kind of a standoff, and that um, that um, I and and I'm thinking of the the residents who now currently own those properties up there that this needs to be resolved, um, and that's why we we hold these monies. It's it's actually to protect them to make sure that due diligence is done around these plans. So um, so I'm just putting that out to. Um, you know, the mayor and, and staff, if, you know, a, an additional two weeks might help in bringing about some sort of a, agreement. I was, I was hoping Mr. Melnick would stay on the line. I see he's not in the room right now. Uh, but um, so that's my thought. I can't, um, go ahead. I, I can't speak for Mr. Melnick, but, you know, again, his specific request and public comment was we issued a denial letter. Right. If the period is delayed, we're not going to we're not going to take any action unless he comes to the table and says you can correct the problem. The next letter we would write is once you gave us authority to spend the money, we would write him formally and say we have authority to spend the money. Here's your last chance to meet these standards. So if he, if if what he really wants is that denial letter, we won't be able to do that to you act. If something else would get him going, then that would be great. So and my, and my my and again I, I I've talked to the solicitor about this. Um, there's no you know there's we didn't there's no violation of notice or anything like that. There's no notice requirement. Um, and again I, I would say you know it's always a little bit hard when someone's at a meeting telling you they didn't know anything about the meeting. Um, so but clearly he's at the meeting and he knows about it and the, the DPW has been corresponding with him about this issue for, for many, many, many years. Um, and the fact that this has sort of gotten his attention, I think is important. And, um, and I hope it does um, draw a resolution, but I don't think two more, I don't think two weeks, um, I, I think the fact that these monies would be available will hopefully draw a quick resolution. Because um, two weeks, we're gonna be right where we were. And as Director Fiden said, what he's asking for as the resolution is not a resolution in the city's view. The resolution is to, to, is to, to perform, to, you know, to, to, to perform, to, to provide the information that when you were issued the permit, you said you would provide. That's, that's what's at issue here. So I just feel like um, not much will change in two weeks. Um, and again, I, even if you release the money, it's unlike, you know, you could, we could talk next week. Um, I just feel that that's the, that's, I don't think that's gonna advance it. 
So can I ask one further question uh, to follow up on that? So if we release the monies, there's obviously going to be a delay in there anyway, because uh, we don't have the engine. Do we have the engineer lined up to go and do oh, this? No, so he no. has time to intervene. Yes. And um, we don't want to do this. I mean, uh, this is not, I, we, I this agree. is not, we don't want to do this just like we didn't want to do it in the North view. This is like right. an extreme last resort. <laughs> um, and frankly, you know, the, he could, you know, the money would go much further if it wasn't a public project, because if we step in, then it becomes a public project. So, um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, this isn't going to um, happen tomorrow, or, you know, it's going to take a while for this to, to happen. I mean, Director Loscalia or Wayne could probably speak to that better, but, um, you know, certainly th there'll be time, but, but I do think it's important that, you know, we, we advance this to the next step. Um, because we've been, you know, been corresponding about this for quite some time. Director Lascalia. Um, yes, good evening to everyone. It, it, it is definitely my preference that Mr. Melnick provides the information that we have been requesting um, for years, actually. Um, that's what we want. This is not something that my department wants to take on or manage. Um, it, it's, it's certainly... Um, you know, we want to spend our time, um, you know, engaged in other projects and, and not engaged in a, in a private development here. Um, but we want to ensure this is done properly, um, but, but this is not something that we actually want to manage. So, so what we're looking for from Mr. Melnick is information. Um, it is possible that he has done everything that he needs to do. We just don't know that because he won't provide us the information we have repeatedly requested. Um, and, and again, you know, we have a, a very long paper trail of this documentation. Um, so what I need from Mr. Malnick is the communication that we have been requesting. And, and if he's already done it, um, that's great. I, I just need to see the paper. I, I need something from an engineer. And, and again, that is our preference. Councillor Dwight. Well, you, uh, all of you have answered uh, my initial question, which was going to be, I mean, uh, what level of communication has occurred between you and Mr. Melnick? And, and, and it appears, and, and as I recall, Callan describing that this has been a long ongoing process. And the reason an escrow account exists, the reason escrow is to assure compliance to the conditions and terms that essentially are a contract. And that is the part that is uh, decided in courts, depending on if the contract was made in bad, uh, in, in bad form, if it was, if, if the city is violated in some way, but our, our responsibility is just to release funds based on, um, because this is we have fiduciary oversight, our job is to determine whether it's appropriate to do as uh, the DPW and the planning board have requested that uh, that we invoke the um, the final the the only the only uh, agency or, a, or the only system that that can our last resort is to make him comply. So what we've got left is the escrow account. And our, and I, I, you know, Mr. Melnick, um, the rest of it is not uh, the, the, the rest of the legal stuff is not up to us, but we do after hearing the case made by the, uh, the both directors of, of planning and the DPW, I'm inclined to uh, vote in favor of this uh, in, in second reading to invoke the conditions of the escrow account. Councillor Mary. No. Yeah, I have a few questions. I'll try to focus here. Um, I mean, I, I, I as as uh, as the Ward Seven representative, I did alert uh, Mr. Melnick to this meeting. So and he, he wasn't at the first. So I, 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 I hear that he didn't know about the specific 
process. But what I'm also seeing is like eight years, that's a long time and you know, longer, right? Since 2008. Um, and there's an issue of like not accepting the premise, uh, which is making it really complex. I don't, I don't think he, uh, so, so director Lascali, are you saying he, it sounds like he never, he just never answered or he just disagreed with the premise of what you were asking. <laughs> just curious really. Um, I, I, I will try to answer that question yeah. to the best of my ability. It's okay. Um, it might not be the right question. I have another one, but if, yeah, try. It, it's okay. <laughs> it, I mean, the, the stormwater permit is clear. Um, okay. the, we are issuing a permit and putting requirements on permittees in accordance with state standards. Um, right. We don't list every single state standard in our permit, M much like in a building permit, we don't say, well, you have to have a door and you have to have a doorknob. And, it, right. you know, we don't really get to that granular level of detail when we issue a permit. Um, but when we ask for information to satisfy our permit requirements, um, I think that that part of the nuance here is a, a misunderstanding of the fact that, you know, this granular level of detail is not in the permit, but we are yeah. trying to satisfy the state standards for stormwater um, the, with this project to ensure that the, the project has been constructed properly for the benefit of the city and the residents. Um, so with that being said, I think that the, um, uh, you know, the, the lack of information that has been provided to us may be a misunderstanding uh, of the uh, detail level within the permit, but it, it, at the end of the day, uh, the DPW is within its rights to hold permittees to the state standards. And that's what we are doing. And we do that for everybody's protection. And we do that to ensure a quality project that, that will actually uh, hold up over time and not fail for the people who have bought into this project. Um, so at this point, the, the information vacuum that we are in puts us in a position where it, we are really in a state of paralysis. We are not able to entertain any amendment to this permit um, because we have really basic requirements that are not being satisfied. Um, I, right. I will also mention that, that part of the permit requirement is an annual report on October 1st of every year. Um, I do not have an annual report and it's right. past October 1st. So um, there, there's sort of a, a lengthy story here, but the bottom line is the state standards are upheld and we are the authority that upholds those state standards and that's what we're trying to do here. Okay, that's, that's actually quite helpful, thank you. I just, um, it's complex, so I wanted to make sure that uh, that's what I was gathering um, from the correspondence. Um, I guess on, on a, you know, on a kind of moving forward level, um, kind of what, what Councilor Nash was saying, I mean, we vote tonight and then there's, it, and if it, it goes forward, it, is there opportunity for recourse here? I mean, I know that, I, I know that, I believe that uh, Mr. Melnick's engineer actually passed away. And I'm not sure who certifies, of, who does the certification? Is it any engineer or does it have to be a state engineer or? A, I, need a I need an engineer license. licensed in the Commonwealth, correct? Okay, right, right. So it doesn't have to be a city engineer. I mean, city. Uh, Massachusetts, right. Maybe, Massachusetts right, right. engineer. Okay. So in any case, so I, I believe I might not be correct about this, that he doesn't actually have an engineer. So I'm just thinking like, what's the time um, yeah, and so if he wanted to uh, remedy this issue, is there would there be time um, after this vote, if it was positively voted on, for him to do so? It's, uh, it sounds like that's what you would prefer, strongly prefer. But I just trying to th picture the time uh, frame if he has to hire an engineer or whatever the issue might be there. But. It, yeah, I think it, I want to be very clear with everybody yeah. that it is my preference that Mr. Melnick uh, produces the information okay. that we have been requesting. I, I do not want to use city resources uh, to pursue this. That That's not an avenue I'm interested in going down. So I am more than happy to, to work yeah. with him on this. It, but again, it, it has dragged on uh, 
for a really extended time period. So we do have to be reasonable here. Right. So I guess if he, barring no change in that you would have to pursue um, hiring an engineer, the city would, what, what would the time frame be? Is that something that happens quickly or does it happen? I'm, I'm just curious like how long that would, um, if you, you get know, no response from uh, Mr. Melnick. It, yeah, there can certainly be a lag time in engaging an engineering firm to do something like this, but I would anticipate that we would start that process and have some resolution in 60 to 90 days. Okay, thank you. That's quite helpful. Thank you, Director. Councilor Quinlan. I just want to say that, you know, um, you know, I was curious about this and I feel like as a group, we've asked a lot of good questions and and, and to the mayor and, and to the two directors, I think the responses have been, uh, been you know, completely appropriate. And they put me in the position where, where I would support taking this, um, this funding to, to get this job done. Uh, unfortunately, maybe. maybe we'll see. Other questions? Okay, Councillor Maori. Yes, I just wanted to add something, which is, um, I believe, I, I forgot who might who brought this up, but you know, we have to be mindful of the of the um, residents up there in Beaverbrook, and that if this isn't dealt with, it could potentially fall back on the homeowners association up there. Just just to put that stakeholder in there. Any other questions, comments, discussion? Okay, thank you, Director Lascalia for joining us um, and Director Fiden as well. Um, Laura, roll call please on second reading. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. And Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. We're moving to ordinances for referral. Um, there's 20.139, an ordinance to add section 285-31 newspaper boxes. Move to refer to uh, legislative matters, please. Motion, motion's been made by Councilor Dwight, seconded by Councilor Thorpe to refer to legislative matters. Any discussion on referral? Can I just okay. ask a... Oh. Councilor Foster. Thank you, sorry, I forgot to wait to be recognized. Um, just a point of clarification, I, I had pulled up the agenda for legislative matters earlier and it looks like it, this will be discussed at the, at the upcoming meeting. Is that yes. the intent? Okay. So, yes. thank you. Yes, so was your question Monday. was why it was on the agenda before? Laura we, anticipates if, if it had been referred to something in addition to legislative matters, it would have been not discussed at legislative matters. But um, Laura is so good at organizing us. She tries to anticipate this. And so uh, obviously at this time, this would be past the time to be able to put it on that agenda. So she tries to- Ah, sorry. Very yeah, organized. That's great. Thank, thank you. I was anticipating it being further out. So thank you for, for that. So it'll, be, it, it'll be on, on the meeting on Monday, just so you know, it's coming up Monday. Monday, Monday, Monday. <laughs> okay, let's refer it first. Um, any discussion on referring it? Okay, roll call please on the referral. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Yes. Councillor Labarge. So we come back Labarge. from recusal. You there, Councillor Labarge? We've moved on. You can come back. 
We may have um, stepped away or. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Councilor Maori. Yes. Okay. So now it will be on the agenda on Monday, Monday, Monday. Uh, <laughs> moving on to ordinances, we have 20.121, an ordinance to amend section 5.3 to reduce the setback from street lot lines for accessory stables. This um, was uh, went to planning board and legislative matters and received positive recommendations from both. Why don't I read it? and then we'll get a motion. So this is upon the recommendation of build, uh, Building Department and Office of Planning and Sustainability, um, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, Friday, Chapter 358, Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended to reduce the setback from street lot lines for accessory stables. Um, uh, so we're gonna modify this section. So 5.3 accessory uses A, keeping, so this is what it says now, the keeping of farm animals to include all farm animals and exotics in a related private stable for personal use is permitted as an accessory use in accordance with the following conditions. Three, the location of any stable shall, now we're adding not, be less, and then we're taking out that 100 feet from any street lot line, not less. So now it says shall not be less than 30 feet from any lot line. Move approval, please. Second. Motion's been made by Councilor Dwight and I think seconded by Councilor Mayori. Discussion. Uh, Councilor Dwight. It's, uh, uh, Carolyn, can, is Carolyn here still? I don't know. Um, I don't see I don't Carolyn. So. No. I had um, called Director Fiden earlier today with a question about the previous agenda item and he had said Carolyn wouldn't be here tonight that he would be here to speak. Okay. oh right right and it, but but it's okay we we did have this discussion on legislative matters and essentially this is one of those anomaly um zoning things that maybe made sense back in the day and I, no one seems to know what day that was actually but the fact is is that in every other circumstance the setbacks is you'll note are 30 feet everywhere else on a lot except for one that abuts on a road. And it's where it's 100 feet, which is pretty substantial. And no one really can quite understand what the reason for that was, maybe to keep animals out of sight from the streetscape. I don't know. The fact is, is that it doesn't come up a lot. It really doesn't lend itself to uh, um, a problem anymore, as if it were ever a problem. But there are there is an applicant who lives on a corner so <laughs> that means essentially 100 feet it, it renders a stable impossible for uh something that for a, a resident who basically conforms in every other way and meets all the other conditions so this is just simply a a correction that um and we came to understand that it was um something we do periodically as we make up for things that were decided maybe a hundred years ago we don't know so well no not in that case if it's a setback laws wasn't a hundred years ago but in any event um there was no uh opposition to the proposal so there that's and i think that's it in a nutshell right I, there, was, I, there are no I, nays there were no names. Right. Oh, wow. You guys are really <laughs> going for it. Oh. <laughs> oh! I lose impulse control when it gets later. Sorry. <laughs> um, any discussion? Okay. There shouldn't be after that. <laughs> Laura. Roll call, please. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. 
Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Maori? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. All right, that passes in first reading. Our last item on the agenda is to deliberate and vote on community resources request to suspend council rule 2.6.2.6.1, requiring reporting within 60 days and to refer um, 20.114 plaster production and sustainability ordinance to the disability commission. So, oh, um, Councilor Jarrett. I'm just going to recuse myself uh, because we we're discussing this plastic reduction ordinance and there may be a conflict or uh, there may be a conflict of interest. Okay. Um, Councillor Jarrett is recused. So, we'll table, please. Second. Okay. It's been made and seconded. Um, just to kind of frame it for everybody. So the Plastic Reduction and Sustainability Ordinance is with the Community Re Resources Committee where they've been having an in-depth discussion and gathering information. Um, and they have a public forum which is scheduled for November 16th, which brings them just past the 60 day deadline for reporting out of committee, um, which is in our rules. And our rules are very clear that reporting means giving a recommendation. So a positive, a negative or a neutral recommendation. Um, so what they would like to do is have that forum and then vote on a recommendation after that forum. Um, so it's my interpretation that we need to suspend the, the rule that requires a report within 60 days to, um, to allow that to do them, allow them to do that. Um, so that, and Councillor Nash, I don't know if you have anything you wanna to add to that um, or Councillor Dwight. Well, I, I just want to comment that this is unprecedented. So just so it's clear that the reason that we're making this unprecedented proposal is that um, this ordinance, it, no one's trying to ram anything through and no one's trying to hamstring anybody. This is being very thoroughly vetted, more thoroughly vetted than many ordinances that we've seen in the past with a lot of outreach. And as such, the reason we have this rule is <clears throat> that we don't do with this what, uh, for instance, the legislature did with the Roe Act. You don't throw it in the committee and then let it die there and let it molder there without any action. We require a 60-day clock to move items through to be addressed by the council and voted on. You can't, you can't bury it in the committee. And... And it's good. It's a very good rule. And uh, I wish the state would take our cue. That said, the due diligence that's been done uh, with Councilor Nash's committee and by the uh, Youth Commission and by another uh, number of members of the community who are, who are deeply vested in this, including the business owners, um, you know, one of the rich, uh, our is very commendable, but one of the, one of the things, the pushback that we got was, of course, there wasn't enough outreach. And I, I just want to go on the record that the Youth Commission worked a year and a half on outreach, contacting and communicating with virtually every business that they could come up with that would uh, that actually used um, uh, to go containers and the like. Um, their response was anemic. Um, when they actually did get a response, the uh, people were very helpful. But the fact is, is that outreach was attempted. It was, didn't make it much in some folks' priority until it became actually uh, an ordinance. So I am grateful that everyone's participating in this, in the conversation and that we, and in fact, I believe the ordinance will come out even better as a result. But um, uh, it's, I, just want to emphasize that we've never done this before. We've never done this before. And, uh, and we are doing it in, in good faith. And, I, and I'm grateful for all the work that everyone's put into this. Uh, Councilor Mayori. Right. I, have to, I feel compelled to, to let everyone know what a stand-up job Councilor um, Nash has been doing um, on this. I mean, he's been going 
endlessly up and down to establishments and engaging in really meaningful conversations with businesses. And I deeply appreciate it. I deeply appreciate the whole process and I'm learning this whole process. And I, I think the reason I, I didn't know that this was unprecedented, but I mean, with the, with the pandemic happening, um, it, we really need to, to take, to, to really thoroughly make sure this is, will work. And so that the impact once it is passed is that it is very implementable and it's doable and we've, foreseen um, issues. So that's uh, why I think this is particularly because of the pandemic, I think, um, and the stress on businesses, I think this is incumbent upon us to do this and take our time with it. Then thank you, Councilor Nash. Thank you. Councilor Nash. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the kind words and for acknowledging my unprecedented request here and that, um, that, uh, you know, we, we have been having some um, really uh, productive discussions. We're gathering a lot of information and um, that uh, I'm, I'm finally reaching the point where I think I really actually understand most of the ordinance. It's actually very complex, all of the different materials and uh, the different ways that it'll play out for businesses. Um, most importantly, that, that the approach that we've been taking is to rather than just have a hearing back at our first meeting to say yes or no and send it forward with a recommendation is to actually engage the business community so we have an informed discussion. And that, um, and that because of the technical nature of these containers, it's really hard to engage a lot of people in it. There, there are some businesses that are uh, like Belly of the Beast and Woodstar and Harold's, they're really up on what it is they're using. But then there's other businesses that are just, they're just buying what their suppliers are providing to them and that's what's going out the door. Um, I will say this, that the, uh, that first of all, I wanna commend the Youth Commission that we've basically been partnered up on doing the outreach here that, um, and in fact, the Youth Commission's been doing a lot of heavy lifting around this. And so we have actually been using our resources to help them out. And that um, I mentioned earlier the, that they've had five, well, I don't know if I mentioned, they've had five meetings with uh, the business community via Zoom. Um, they've had uh, regular contact with Amy Kalane and uh, we've developed flyers. and. I've been working with them to engage door to door as requested uh, by some of the businesses downtown saying that you need to do this kind of outreach. And, um, and uh, been working with Rena Pye and Marty Nathan. They've also been helping with that outreach. Last Saturday, the Youth Commission flyered Florence, to the, the uh, food businesses there. Um, and that um, the, what we're, what we're discovering is that the people, I, you know what, I don't want to summarize too much. I, I will say that the, um, that the outreach has been effective and that, um, and that we're, I think we're, we can, you know, when this, my goal is that when it comes to council, that people will be informed about what's going on here. There will be no surprises and they'll be able to talk to what is in this ordinance and, and, and there won't, I, 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 I don't expect people coming into the room and saying, I didn't know this was going on. Um, so um, so I, I would appreciate the extension and I, I think that uh, the outreach will be fruitful for all of council. Thank uh, you. Councilor Dwight. Oh of information simply I, I, this also includes a referral and i should probably make that part of my motion the to refer this to the disability committee as well um yeah i mean so uh does someone want to speak to that request we could separate them out as two two separate motions just so that it's not an agenda item so a separate agenda item so i don't know if i should include it in my motion and I, the disability commission, not committee, I should emphasize it is a commission. Okay. Councilor Nash. Well, I, to that, I, to that piece, I, I completely support that. Um, 
we, one of the things we, we uh, during our outreach, dur you know, from uh, both people in the community, you know, uh, customers in the community and from, from the businesses concern about having the, the, the actual uh, materials to be able to, you know, um, to sell products to all sorts of people who have so um, and I think that the Disability Commission would uh, be able to provide us some really clear guidelines around you know wh what would be great accommodations in terms of the exemptions that um, are considered within this ordinance. Councillor Dwight. For clarity's sake I mean uh, principally the focus ADA focus would be um, about the use of straws, uh, flexible straws. Just so everyone's clear, it's not in, and that if someone's wondering why we would refer this to the Disability Commission, um, just so that now. Okay. Um, and it can, just so, also for people's information, it can be at the Disability Commission and also be at Community Resources at the same time. Yes. So this will not be delaying this process. Councillor Nash? Yeah, I'm not expecting it to uh, go beyond straws, but I would not rule it out in terms of what people's needs are because that's why we're asking them to weigh in. Is there any anything we're missing? And um, so. Okay. Councillor Foster. I would like to echo the thank you for Councillor Nash for his hard work on this and, and Councillors Mayori and Dwight um, and the Youth Commission. It's been, um, I know it's been an awful lot of hard work and just wanted to support the extension. I understand the urgency um, of, of moving this forward and at the same time, a process that's truly collaborative that has pulled in, um, that has gathered and solicited the feedback from the Disability Commission, as well as um, the extent of the outreach to the downtown businesses, I think is, is really critical on this one. And um, I, I believe it's, I didn't realize it was unprecedented either, but um, I believe it's worth the extra time and um, you definitely support this. Thank you. Um, so Councillor Dwight, do you want to add in this referral to your motion? Yeah, that's what I was saying. I would like to, and if, if whoever second, I forgot who second, it was an hour and a half ago, but, uh, but uh, if they'd agree, I'd appreciate it. Does the seconder say again? I believe it was Councillor Thorpe. You down with that? <laughs> okay, good. All good. Councillor Nash. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, when, so since we're extending the deadline, I'd like to know what the deadline is. <laughs> so are we, is the goal for the next council meeting to have a recommendation or are we going to, do we want to do a 30 day or how do we want to handle this? Well, my understanding and correct me if I'm wrong, was that the plan was that you would vote on a recommendation after the forum on the same day. Is that incorrect? That, that is the plan. And it would be till the 16th. The 16th. Okay. And then reporting to council on, what is it? The 17th? No, no, it's 17, 18th, 18th. 19th. 19th. Okay. Yeah. But you it got... has to go back to a legislative matters. Right. So you, that's true. So you wouldn't be recorded. You, you would vote um, and it, it would then move on to legislative matters. If, as long as it's, uh, whenever it's done at the disability commission, I'm not sure when their next um, uh, Disability Commission, um, which I did say today, it's on um, November 10th Oops. at four o'clock, in which I had already talked to Councillor Nash <laughs> at the first meeting that he had, that I would get it set up. But like I said today, what had happened was the ADA coordinator didn't realize it was a holiday weekend and we were supposed to go through this whole ordinance, our commission. So now it's booked for November 10th. Perfect. It's on the okay. agenda. Everybody has the ordinance. Great. Um, then we'll refer it there. Um, 
so it would be there on the 10th and then um you would vote on the 16th and then it would be a council on the no then it would go to legislative matters when do we have to send the report in councilor share so a report is real is just the vote you know what what um constitutes a report in our rules is that when we refer something to a committee, one of our subcommittees, that they take a vote on a recommendation. So that would be um, the vote that community resources would take, and then it would be the the recommendation that um, the disability commission would would take. That would that would uh, who, constitute the report. Who are we sending our recommendation to? Um, I I Laura. <laughs> I guess how, however we. The council, it the recommendation you're making to the council, and I want everyone to understand, we're not going to be addressing this on the council floor until the middle of December, just so we're clear. And that will be the first time it comes with, hopefully, out of all the committees, if all the committees are able to move it further. So I would be very reluctant to agree to a 30 day extension beyond that and bring it into January. Cause we don't even know if there's gonna be a plan in January. So I'm just saying. So remind us when is the next legislative matters meeting that falls after the 16th? Uh, be. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I'm looking. December 14th. Yeah. Okay, so it would be at on um, December 14th at Legislative Matters. So as exactly as Councilor Dwight said, it would be at Council on December 17th. That's gonna be the first reading on that? Um, yes. That would be the first reading, yes. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, so we're gonna take a roll call on suspending the council rule requiring reporting within 60 days. And also we're gonna refer uh, 20.114 to the Disability Commission. Okay, Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Okay. That uh, has, those rules have been suspended and it has been referred. I know of no other business. So is there a motion to adjourn? To adjourn. Second. Motion's been made by Councilor Maori, seconded by Councilor Thorpe to adjourn. Laura, roll call please on adjourning. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. And Councilor Shara. Yes, we are adjourned.